Okay, let's get underway. Um, being 10 o'clock, I declare open this hearing of the COVID-19 Select Committee as set out in the circulated program. This morning, the committee will hear evidence from the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator the Honourable Richard Colbeck, and officers of the Department of Health and the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. The committee does understand the demands on ministers and public servants at this time, and we appreciate the time being made available to witnesses to give evidence uh, today. Information on the procedural rules governing public hearings and claims of public interest immunity have been provided to departments and agencies and are available from the Secretariat. An officer called to answer a question for the first time should state their full name, the capacity in which they appear, and witnesses should speak clearly and into the microphones to assist Hansard to record proceedings. Mobile phones should be switched off or turned to silent. Just before I hand over uh, to establish um, who would like to make some opening comments, uh, colleagues, I have a number of, sort of housekeeping matters to deal with um, because they may be relevant to the hearing today. Um, there is a, a letter which has been provided to you on email by Ms Laffin correcting some evidence um, from the hearing on the 4th, I believe, on the 4th of August. Uh, so that letter will be, um, with your agreement, approved for publication. So members can ask questions about that. You also have an opening statement by Ms Anderson around evidence she gave on the 4th of August. So with your agreement, that will be uh, made available for public uh, publication. Senator Seawitt, there's a question on notice that's been provided in uh, your name, which under our normal rules would be um, you know, not published for another 24 hours or till five o'clock tomorrow, I think it came in, um, just listing some age, the aged care services with five or more staff or resident cases and the names of those. So with the agreement of the committee, um, I think we should agree for publication of that so people can ask questions. Yes, that would be appreciated. Okay, thank you. And I've also received, the committee has received a letter from um, Minister Colbeck um, with a copy of the review of Dorothy Henderson Lodge um, as per his commitment of the 4th of August. That document is actually already published on the Aged Care Royal Commission uh, website, so I don't think there's any huge issues in agreeing for that to be published, as it's already a public document, but I draw that to your attention. There's one remaining matter, which is a letter from uh, Professor Murphy around um, the uh, um, outbreaks with in Victoria in aged care facilities with less than five cases uh, and a request to consider that letter, uh, the contents of that letter. My suggestion is we deal with that at our next private um, meeting. I just don't think there's time this morning to have the discussion that's probably warranted around that and uh, around the publication of those uh, facilities names or otherwise. So with your agreement, we will hold that over for the next public hearing, uh, private meeting. Okay, thank you. That's dealt with all the housekeeping. Um, Minister, would you like to make any opening comments? Yes, please, I would. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, can, firstly, thanks to the committee and uh, thank you for the uh, consideration that you gave us at the last hearing with respect to time, as you acknowledged in your opening statement, that the, the, um, the call and the time particularly the officials at the moment with what's happening in Victoria is significant. So I want to thank you for that. Uh, I'd like to um, also acknowledge the number of old Australians who have lost their lives during uh, this very tragic outbreak in Victoria. Um, I'd like to extend mine and the government's condolences to their families. Um, uh, this has been an extremely difficult time for them and their families. I've spoken to quite a few of them, it's very easy to see the impact that this uh, pandemic is having on those, but particularly those whose family members are in residential aged care. So I want to extend my uh, sincerest condolences to all of those who have been impacted uh, by the virus. Uh, every death is an absolute tragedy and uh, uh, I want to recognise that as part of uh, my appearance before the hearing this morning. Uh, can I also acknowledge the incredible work that's been done by the very dedicated aged care workforce? This is an extremely difficult time for them. Uh, personal carers, the nurses, cleaners, cooks, administration, 
um, staff, gardeners, everybody who works in residential care. This is extremely diff difficult. Um, some of them are quite frightened, uh, but they continue to work, to turn up to work every day uh, in very difficult circumstances and, and uh, I might say um, under uh, some quite unfair scrutiny at times. Um, uh, and the, and the circumstances that they're having to deal with are extremely confronting. So I just want to acknowledge the work that they're doing. It is important. Um, we need them to come to work every day and uh, I want to acknowledge their work. Uh, Chair, I, I would like to also note that during this COVID-19 pandemic, no country has been able to avoid outbreaks in residential aged care that we're seeing in Australia. Uh, where there's been widespread community transmission, the reality is that we will continue to see outbreaks in all parts of our community, um, but we see tragically the results that, that occur in residential aged care. The susceptibility of older people to COVID-19 has been at the core of the government's planning and response to the pandemic right from the start and has guided both the overall public health response and of course the implementation of specific measures. The particular, the potential impact on aged care has been at the heart of our thinking and planning in terms of preparedness, pre prevention and control right from the outset. From the stages of the pandemic, uh, the government, me, my department, together uh, with the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission have brought the sector together to continue to plan and prepare. We've continued to update and refine our planning documents such as the CDNA National Guidelines for the Prevention Control and public health management of COVID-19 outbreaks in residential aged care facilities in Australia as our knowledge about the virus grew and the circumstances changed. Uh, I've also been to ERC a number of times looking for support uh, and, and that's resulted in a series of funding measures to assist us to support the aged care sector and providers during the outbreak. Uh, as I think I said at the last hearing, we've continued to engage closely with the aged care sector stakeholders and peak bodies, uh, including uh, individual providers uh, and consumer peaks, uh, to make sure that our contact was continuous, uh, but we could all uh, continue to, sh to share our learnings and update our learnings as we've continued to manage our way through this virus uh, and this pandemic. Uh, we're still learning about the virus and we continue to build on the lessons learned. Uh, we can always do it better, and I want to emphasise that. I acknowledged at the last hearing that there were some things that we hadn't got right. Um, we will continue to work uh, to, be, uh, to be prepared, to make sure that we're resourced as best we can, um, and, and we, we, we continue to work, uh, particularly with the Victorian Government, to assist to bring uh, this um, current outbreak under control, get community transmission under control, because at the end of the day, once we get the community transmission managed and dealt with, uh, everyone in our residential aged care uh, facilities uh, will be safer. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Ms Colbeck. Um, Ms Anderson, I am aware you have a, some opening comments you'd like to make. Professor Murphy, are you? Uh, no, Chair, I think I'll okay, uh, thank stick you. with Senator uh, Minister Colbeck's opening statement just to e echo um, on behalf of the department our condolences to those who've lost lives and the impact that this has had on uh, on many elderly Australians. But uh, I will stick with Minister's opening statement. Thank you very much, Professor Murphy. Ms Anderson. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Janet Anderson, Commissioner, Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. Uh, good morning and thank you for the opportunity to appear before the committee again today. Over the past couple of weeks, as the ministers observed, uh, there have tragically been more people in aged care homes in Victoria who have lost their lives to COVID-19. And as I was reminded last Saturday in an email sent to me by a woman who lost her mother to this virus and who attached the most wonderful photo of her, each death is not a number in the daily tally, but a person who lived and loved and was loved. Every death arising from this virus is a tragedy and I offer my sincere condolences to every family who has been affected. Since my last appearance, I wrote to the committee chair to provide additional information to the evidence I provided on the day concerning the outbreak at St Basil's home for the aged Victoria. As advised in that correspondence, 
I am now aware that the Commission has received, had received information on the 10th of July via our telephone assessment contact about a COVID-19 outbreak at the home. Although the Commission is not the first responder in a COVID-19 outbreak, and our understanding at the time was that the Public Health Unit had been contacted, I recognise that we erred in not escalating this information to the Commonwealth Department of Health at the time, and we should have done better. We have since reviewed our risk escalation procedures to ensure that any intelligence about an outbreak is immediately shared with the Commonwealth Department of Health and the relevant Public Health Unit. Our processes for sharing data and intelligence are now significantly enhanced and we are routinely sharing data daily with the Department of Health and the Victorian Department of Health and Human Services. Our primary role as the aged care regulator is to hold providers to account for the quality and safety of care delivered to old Australians. In the context of the pandemic, we are using the full range of our regulatory powers to ensure that providers are doing everything possible and necessary to protect those for whom they are providing care. The pandemic is ongoing and we are reflecting deeply on our practices and learning how we can improve. We are committed to taking these accumulating lessons, applying them and sharing the information with the sector to support the work that every provider must do to ensure the effectiveness of their preparation, management of risks, response to and recovery from an outbreak at their service. Since I last appeared before this committee, the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission has further extended our regulatory activities, and I would welcome the opportunity to outline this additional work for the committee. The Commission remains on duty, vigilant, and focused on undertaking our important role. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Ms Anderson. Um, I might start with some questions uh, to you, Minister Colbeck. Uh, can you confirm that the Australian Government is the primary funder and regulator of aged care in Australia? That's correct. And can you confirm throughout the COVID-19 crisis it's been the Australian Government's responsibility to establish and maintain infection control guidelines, healthcare standards and quality standards for residential aged care facilities? We have done that. That's correct, that you have responsibility for that? Yes, and we've done that, yes. And it's been the Australian Government's responsibility to keep people in residential aged care safe from the COVID-19 infection? It's your, well, been your job, Minister. We've, our responsibility is to uh, provide information to the aged care sector to, and, and to ensure that they have the appropriate systems in place to provide high quality care to the senior Australians in residential aged care. In terms of a gov government's responsibility though, it's the Commonwealth's responsibility to ensure that people in residential aged care are, are safe, particularly during a pandemic. Well, we're responsible for the standards and the setting of the standards and, the, and through the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission, the application of the standards. So you're saying it's not your job to keep people in residential aged care safe from the pandemic? Well, in combination with the states, it's everybody's responsibility to prevent the spread of the virus. Uh, and that's the purpose of the government's national pandemic plan. And of course, uh, other elements of that, which is the front line of our defence. Uh, and, and so we all work in concert to deal with that, because as I've said to you on a number of occasions, uh, while there's community spread, uh, and, and I said in my statement just a moment ago, while there's community transmission of the virus, there is a risk of it entering residential aged care. Uh, that's been stated on a number of occasions and, and it remains the case. While ever there's community transmission of COVID-19, there will be a risk of it being transmitted into residential aged care facilities and other workplaces, including, uh, as we've seen in Victoria hospitals and uh, other workplaces. But you've accepted that the Australian Government is in charge of aged care in Australia? We are the principal funders and regulators in, of aged care in Australia. You're in charge of aged care, correct? We are, we are the principal funders and regulators of aged care in Australia. Why is it so hard to say that you're in charge, that you're the government in charge of aged care? We are the principal, well, it's, 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 it's a, an obvious statement, Chair. We are the principal funders and regulators of aged care in Australia. Um, that's, that, that's a simple fact. 
I'm, I'm, I'm accepting that. We are the principal funders and regulators of aged care in Australia. Thank you, Minister. How many residents of aged care facilities funded and regulated by the Australian government have passed away from COVID-19? I'll just have to look up my latest report, Chair. That might take me a moment. Could an official help if the minister's not able to? Ms Lavin. Amy Lavin, Acting First Assistant Secretary of the Aged Care Reform and Compliance Division. As at 8am on the 20th of August, 258 care recipients had passed away. Of those, 254 were residential care recipients. 254? 54, and the remaining four home care recipients. Minister, you weren't aware of that number? I was just trying to find my latest SIPRIP, Chair. I, I, um, it wasn't in the frontline details of those figures. I have got the details. I just couldn't find it. Uh, it's a hand. I'm sorry. Um, Minister, how many residents of aged care facilities funded and regulated by the Australian Government have COVID-19 today? Uh, again, Senator, I don't have the report with the actual detail in front of me. I'll have to ask... Um, Minister, oh. I mean, you've just you have it. You don't know how many people have passed away. You're now telling me you don't know how many people have the infection. Chair, You're I, the minister for Chair, aged I'm care. Just, There's a I'm serious. Looking for, I'm looking for the report on my IT system, it, and I. But it's not I front of mind for you as minister for aged care. I mean, the Senator, numbers. I mean, they're pretty important details as we're going through this. Uh, pandemic and the heartbreaking scenes in Victoria, I, I, I'm just struggling to believe that you are not aware of these details. So, Chair, the active cases in Victoria right now is 1,811. And do you know how many people have recovered? Uh, the uh, the change to that number is in the last 24 hours is a reduction of 239. So they would be um, a combination of, of recovered uh, and, uh, and some who would have passed away. So in total, the total numbers of those who've been infected and active cases would be just over 2,000, is that correct? That's correct. Minister, do you or the government accept any responsibility for the unnecessary and avoidable deaths of hundreds of aged care residents during this pandemic? Senator, I think uh, all of us have to uh, accept responsibility for what's occurred here in Australia. Um, what do you mean, uh, all of us? What, who is that? Well, all of, all of us in government and, and, in fact, those of us in the community who've assisted with or participated in the spread of the virus. I mean, uh, at, at, the, at the end of the day, we, as governments, carry the can for the policy and the implementation of that policy. And in that context, um, we accept responsibility. So you do accept responsibility? Yes. Minister, over the past two months, we've seen um, extraordinary scenes of elderly Australians being evacuated out of their homes. Um, we've heard stories of, of um, people being left in soiled clothes, hungry, dehydrated, malnourished. Um, we've heard stories of nurses being deeply traumatised when they've witnessed um, the state of some of these facilities. What's your response to that? How do you explain um, that situation being allowed to occur in Australia? Well, Senator, I wouldn't put it in the context of being allowed to occur, but it has. It's a tragedy. It, 
in, how did in, it how did that happen well in some circumstances it's become it's come about because of uh, uh, for example at uh, uh, St Basil's as we discussed at the last hearing events that we clearly hadn't anticipated but how did you uh, not know I mean how how could the government that's as you've said, has accepted responsibility and is in charge of this system, how could that occur? Could you imagine it occurring in any other system, like childcare, for example? How on earth has it come to this? Well, Chair, um, uh, as I indicated to you previously, in some circumstances, it should not have come to this. I acknowledged at the last hearing that there were things that we could have done better, some things that uh, where we've made mistakes, and, and I acknowledge that again today. Could have been we have, done better. We haven't, we haven't got everything perfectly right, uh, but, Chair, we continue to strive on a daily basis, uh, all of us that are working on this, to act and provide resources in the best interests of everybody in residential aged care in this country. We, we continue to learn from the experiences of previous events uh, and we continue to put those learnings into action, and we've done that continuously through the events of the last uh, couple of months in Victoria, uh, and that's clearly demonstrated by the actions that we've taken. When you talk about could have done better, um, you know, this isn't a paper pushing exercise. This is, you know, in some cases, the end of life care for elderly Australians. Is, is there, you know, could what more could have been done to prevent what the scenes that we have seen in Victoria playing out on our nighttime TV and in the lives of, of these vulnerable Australians? And why was the government, which is in charge of it, absent? Well, I reject the assertion of the question, Chair. In fact, I find it offensive. The government wasn't ab absent. The government has been there every single step of the way, providing every single resource it could muster in the interests of these people. I think it's quite an offensive question that you're, or assertion that you make. Well, I'm not making this I, up, Minister. I, I, I'm not making I, it up. I've seen it. I've, well, I've been contacted well, by the families. So, and, and, and Chair, so have I. And I've spoken to the families and, and, and I've, I've spent time talking to them and working with them to resolve the issues that we've seen. And, and we are all mortified by the circumstances that we've found in those facilities in, uh, in Victoria. Uh, it's a terrible circumstance. Uh, and as I said at the out outset, uh, we thank the staff who have been there and available, and we express our condolences to all of those who've lost family and loved ones. It's a terrible outcome. Uh, but the situation that's occurred in Victoria is that the resources of the entire health sector have been stretched. The resources of the aged care sector have been stretched, where you have uh, close to 2,000 residential aged care workers who are furloughed uh, because of being either co uh, uh, COVID positive or close contacts. The resources of the sector have been significantly diminished and that's why we have continued through this pandemic to bring additional resources to bear so that the residents in that residential aged care facilities can receive the care that they deserve. The, the situation in Victoria remains extremely fragile. We continue to bring additional resources in from other places. We have OSMAP teams on site. We have ADF personnel on site. We have uh, support teams for, of nursing staff, cleaners, PCAs from other states that have been coming in to support the effort to ensure that those scenes that we saw during the outbreak aren't repeated. Uh, but I can say to you quite frankly, that the circumstance in Victoria remains very, very fragile. Yeah, I think we're all is, the workforce. The workforce is extremely stretched, uh, and we spend and, and through the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre, we spend significant time every day working on securing workforce, uh, deciding where we appropriately apply that workforce, so that we ensure that. Uh, residents receive the care that they should receive. So there's considerable effort going into this. Uh, every there day is now. Been all, uh, Senator, there has been all the way through this process. Well, we'll come to that, Minister. We'll through. come to that. We've no, got plenty of questions around um, planning and preparedness. completely your assertion that we haven't been there because we have been there every day 
for many, many hours. Well, it's not just me saying that, Minister. It is not just me saying that. Um, well, sir, Minister, no, 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 I don't care who, who makes the assertion, I will reject it. Minister, when did you become concerned about the growing level of community transmission in Victoria? When was that? I, I've been concerned about that all through the Victorian outbreak, Chair. And when when do you define the Victorian outbreak? I'm trying to establish at what point you became concerned around the level of community transmission in Victoria. Was it in when June? We, Was it in July? In, in June, when we started to see the increase in um, in numbers of of daily uh, contractions. So it was in. You, you became concerned in June? Is that we correct? We were all concerned in June. OK. The government was concerned in June. And so what did you do about it when you became concerned in June? What measures and steps did you take? Well, of course, what we were dealing with on a daily basis then was additional uh, infections in aged care facilities. So we continued to uh, work with respect to uh, our workforce capacity. Uh, we were growing the capacity of our uh, um, uh, responders, clinical first responders that were going into facilities. This is uh, in we June. Bring, this is in we, June. We, we, we were bringing together uh, our uh, uh, teams that were working with facilities on a daily basis because the capacity in Victoria uh, was. Um, uh, wasn't sufficient, so we had to bring uh, case managers in from other jurisdictions to assist, and we continued to build on that as the pandemic uh, built through uh, the, the, that period of time. And in court, of course, uh, we uh, put into place uh, in uh, the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre, which but brought that was until the end of July. Support. That was until the end of July. I'm trying to establish what did you do in June to prepare. What specific steps were taken in June? Well, I've just been through some of those steps, Chair. So they were all taken in June, were they? Well, the we, Aged we Care did. Response Centre was, and that was the end of July. No, but we, we continued to build our capacity uh, as the demand grew in Victoria, uh, all through the, uh, th continuously through the pandemic. The first cases in aged care were in the first week of, of July. This is why I'm trying to understand what happened in June. Um, but if you're, can, can you point me to any evidence, uh, any document around what steps were taken by the government in June? I think there was a couple of letters that might have gone out. Um, were, what additional resources were provided to the sector in the lead up to that as community transmission rose? I mean, we knew community transmission was a risk for people in aged care. So if we acknowledge that community transmission was increasing to concerning levels in June, I'm trying to understand how you, how you then responded to the specific risk that that presented people in aged care. So uh, specifically in June, there was the advice, uh, updated advice to the sector on residential aged okay. care in restrictions. We've got a couple um, of letters going out, yep. And, and noting, well, it, th this, was, this, this was action of the entire government. Um, we were uh, we, meeting weekly with the aged care providers to continue to talk to them about the issues that were occurring and, and, and receiving any feedback from them about uh, uh, concerns that they had. Uh, I will note with respect to the HPPC advice that came uh, in June, which um, uh, worked around uh, uh, visitor restrictions, uh, that with, when the second piece of advice um, came out, and I think that was on, that was early July. Um, yep. uh, that was not accepted by Victoria. They remained at the the um, more restrictive rate. The code of conduct was um, uh, of for uh, visitation was put into place. That was a national process that was negotiated uh, between the providers and. Um, but minister, uh, none of this is about 
um, ramping up the response specifically linked to community transmission. I've heard the Prime Minister, I've heard Professor Murphy, I've heard you say that we couldn't help it because the community transmission levels rose. Well, I am putting to you that community transmission is a risk, a known risk, and as it rose in June, I'm trying to establish exactly what happened in terms of the government that's in charge, what was your response to that increased risk? And I'm not sure you've been able to, to show me or direct well, me to anything other than a couple of letters went out to providers. Well, we, we, we continue to provide advice to the sector around infection control. We continue to talk to the uh, sector about the importance of infection control, of visitor restrictions, and making sure that they had the measures in place to, to uh, prevent the egress or to minimise the possibility of ingress of the virus into facilities. So all of okay. that work was done through well, that period. Well, that advice and seems to have had some cracks in it, wouldn't you suggest? If we've gone from well, very few cases in June to more than 1,400 in August, do you well, think you've done I, enough? As I, as I think I said to you previously, Chair, the only way that you will stop the ingress of the virus into any workplace is to stop the movement of people. Uh, so just, and, 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 and quite frankly, that's not a viable option to completely isolate residential aged care from the rest of the community. That would be the only way that you would, you would do that, would be to completely isolate the sector. So while ever there is community transmission, the, the rate of that community transmission will reflect in the ingress into uh, any workplace. And if you look at the figures, and if you make a comparison of the rate of community transmission, uh, the rate of ingress of the virus into residential aged care facilities, there is a direct correlation. As the curve of community transmission, as there's been more virus in the community, uh, the risk and the, and the actual ingress of it into aged care facilities has grown. And as that uh, uh, community transmission has uh, slowed down, uh, so has the rate of ingress into residential aged care. And the issue here is that people have the virus, they don't know they have it, they're carrying it in an asymptomatic fashion, uh, and, and uh, they're going into workplaces of all kinds, including, unfortunately, residential aged care. Uh, and, and quite often, the first understanding that we have of an infection in a residential aged care facility is the notification of a staff being positive, uh, and by the time we get that notification, in most circumstances, the infection of the facility has already occurred. We Min then take preventative measures within the facility to uh, isolate, to control, and to, ma to manage the outbreak. But the reality is, as, as I've said on a number of occasions and will continue to say, while ever there's community transmission, that will be a factor in the infection of facilities and no country in the world has been able to prevent it. We accept that community transmission is a factor. I also accept that it's a known risk and what I'm trying to establish is what the government did in response to the escalating and growing community transmission rates in Victoria specifically how you responded to protect people in aged care. And I put to you, Minister, that there is a double failure here. Not only did you prevent the infection from getting into more than 100 facilities, and I know you'll, you'll argue the toss there, but the, you then failed to prevent the infection spreading throughout those facilities. And we've got situations where St Basil's, Epping Gardens, the numbers associated with those outbreaks continue to rise six weeks after the first case. So well, do you think uh, you did enough? Do you think the letters to providers and the meetings, do you think that was enough? Chair, there, there are a number of factors that will play through this process. Um, and, and my understanding of the number of, of uh, cases at St Bowser's in particular, that they they have stabilised, they don't continue to rise, not based on the information that I've seen well, most recently. Um, so, 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 you're making, so you're making some, um, some So you're not saying make. that they've gone for six weeks, those outbreaks with numbers increasing? I mean, that's what it says on the website, if you look at it. There were two new cases listed yesterday at St Basil's and more in Epping Gardens. 
the, the, Senator at St Basil's, there was a second infection of a worker who'd come back to work post everybody going to hospital. And so uh, that was a second circumstance of a community outbreak. Uh, so someone coming to work who's contracted the virus in the community. So. Um, uh, so, Minister, are you, are you happy with how the system has responded in Victoria? As Minister, you're in charge. Um, you've seen the, you've seen the, the um, pictures, you've heard the stories, you've spoken to the families. Do you think what's happened, how it's played out there, has been acceptable? And do you think you've done enough to protect vulnerable Australians? Uh, Chair, in some circumstances, it hasn't, as I've said and I've acknowledged and as the Prime Minister has acknowledged, uh, we haven't got it right, uh, and we apologise for that. We are we are not happy that some things haven't worked out. Uh, as we but it's might cost have hoped lives, Senator Colbert. Or, or, we've been, or we have uh, encountered circumstances that uh, none of us had anticipated. Uh, and and we well, we'll come back to we, that because I'm not sure divide, that's entirely divide, true. And we and, and as I've said, uh, it has cost lives, uh, and and uh, that is an absolute tragedy in every single circumstance. And it's a failure of the system to respond properly, and it's a system you're in charge of. Well, it's been a, it's, it's been a system that's been uh, under extreme stress, uh, and we've continued to, to and apply... And a system that you are report, in charge of. And we've continued to apply additional resources to the sector and to the system in conjunction with the, the Victorian government to ensure that those in residential aged care uh, have access to a, 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 the appropriate level of care and hospitalisation where they need it. Mm. A little bit too late for some. Senator Seawitt, would you like the call? Yes, please. Um, can I go to the list that was tabled this morning of the residences where there's been an outbreak of above five? Um, first off, can I ask, are you able to, be, to give us for each of those the numbers of staff and um, uh, residents, particularly, who have had COVID and, and have passed away? All right. and, and secondly, um, who have uh, passed away? Senator. Can I ask also for clarification of the table? We say of resident cases 60 in brackets as at uh, the 17th of August, that's 60 residences that have had these outbreaks. Is that correct? Of more than five. That, that's correct, Senator. Michael Lai, Deputy okay. Secretary, Ageing and Aged Care. Thank you. Um, can I then go to, uh, thank you, I just want to make sure I had fully understood that. Um, can I please go to uh, the issue of whether providers have been given disinformation? As I understand, providers have been asking for a comprehensive list for a significant period of time and uh, have not been given it. Is that correct? The, the um, the data has not been made public as, as consistent with the interactions we've had with the committee, uh, Senator. The, um, the states and territories publish locational information for the benefit of providers and we communicate regularly with providers as, as Mr Colbeck has said, we're talking with them uh, every week and we direct them to that advice. I think uh, in relation to Victoria specifically, the outbreak is so comprehensive within the metropolitan and the, the designated areas within Victoria that um, you know our strong advice to providers is to um, is not to focus on whether the service down the road has got an outbreak, but that to assume that every that, that the level of community transmission means they need to be you know extremely aware about. Um, you know, the, the controls that they have at the entry to their facilities. Um, so my understanding is providers uh, are not happy with that response of being told to go to the States. Um, I'm told that you, that the department has promised to give them heat maps of community transmission. 
They make the point that they actually have to report to both state and Commonwealth, and they need an understanding, a comprehensive understanding of the where there is an outbreak, including less than five, so that they can have an understanding and know what's happening. For example, with movement of staff, and I'll come back to the actual movement of staff between facilities in a minute. Why won't you give it to them? Even, I've heard what you've said, what about on a confidential basis, at least, to these providers? So they can do everything they need to do to ensure that COVID does not get into their facilities. Senator, our, our case managers, our Department of Health case managers, do share that information with services where they believe there is a risk, where, uh, and, the, and the public health unit also do this, where, you know, for example, you might have um, somebody who for various reasons, if they work across a site or there's another um, uh, link, that they, they, they do that task of sharing information between services. The, but, but the publication of, uh, of services uh, with outbreaks, the issue is around, our concern around that has always been that as soon as that information is published, um, that what, what happens is a service that's already under distress and already trying to combat an outbreak is then inundated with um, media and uh, they are trying to work with, to make sure they communicate with families, the, the designated family member who they have a relationship with to give them timely information and it causes it has caused distress with families. And so in, in our mind that that is a more important issue because it, it, it it further degrades the service's ability to respond to an outbreak. That is so our you're concern. Saying, so for a start, you're saying it's in the, the, the department is making those judgment calls as if there is a risk, taking it out of the hands of the provider. And is it, aren't the providers entitled to know where all the potential risks are coming from and enable them to also manage effectively? Senator, can I inter interject here, uh, Brenda Murphy, Secretary? The Victorian government has published on its website detailed local government area case numbers on daily updated. It's very clearly in the public domain where in Victoria, in which suburbs, the number of active cases, the number of historical cases. So in terms of the risk to a facility, that information is readily available in the public domain. Is that so uh, Dr Murphy, uh, Professor Murphy, is that into the detail of the residences or just the heat? That, are just you the, about sub, the, the local government just areas. The suburbs. suburbs. And that is the relevant factor for risk in, in a facility. It's that's what's not what, that's what I, not what I'm being, being uh, told by providers. It's also the providers so they can, uh, the facilities, so they can get an understanding and talk really closely with their staff if they are still moving from multiple uh, across multiple sites, particularly auxiliary staff who aren't getting the same supports that carers and nurses are getting. Well, our, our advice has been that the whole of metropolitan Melbourne is a risk for people moving across multiple sites, and that's why we've been introduced this mechanism to, for care workers to only work at one site, which which we can talk about later. But the risk, in terms of the risk. Uh, for a facility, it's what's in that community, not whether a particular uh, resident, uh, aged care facility has an outbreak at that time. It's what the community transmission is, and that information is readily available, Senator. So you don't think that providers and the peak organisations in aged care have got it right when they're saying, we need this information to be able to properly manage the situation? You're saying they're wrong? No, I'm not, Senator, at all. I'm simply saying that the most important factor for a facility is to know the level of community transmission in their area so that they can pr 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 protect their, their facility. I'm not saying they're wrong, Senator. Uh, well, the fact that you are refusing to give them access to this information, I'd suggest that you don't think they're, they're asked Well, uh, I, I, think, I think, Senator, we, we feel particularly those facilities where there has been a single case, which may be just one worker who has test, contracted the virus in the community, turned up to the facility or been associated with the facility, and because they work there, it's, it's listed as an aged care outbreak, even though there's been no transmission 
whatsoever in that facility. So there are a number of those single case episodes and that facility has not had an outbreak and we think it's completely unreasonable for that facility to be in the public domain. We accept that where there's significant outbreaks, the public has a right to know and that's why we've, we've, we have uh, put in the public domain the more than five uh, facilities. But there is, uh, we have seen many examples of facilities that have been bombarded by the media, where staff have been harassed and where it's really been quite difficult. So it's a balancing act, Senator, and we, 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 accept, we accept that there is a, there is a right for, for the public to know, and we accept the need for transparency, but that has to be balanced. Can I, thank you. Um, I, I will continue to disagree that this information is, uh, shouldn't be made public. I think it's in the public interest that it is, is uh, made public, as do uh, a lot of others and providers. Can I go to the issue of the retention bonus? Now, my understanding is it's not available to community health, uh, community home support uh, workers, program workers. Is that correct? It's the HSP, Senator. Yeah. Uh, well, see, uh, there, there are a number of providers who provide both home care and CHP, CHSP services, but it's available to um, home care the home care program and, and it's not typically provided. It's so frontline workers in a caring role and it's not provided to, uh, you know, um, for example, someone who does gardening. So, so, so there are so there are uh, some, so the answer to your question is- It's not provided is, to any, I mean, Commonwealth Home Support Program workers, A, I'd argue that there's still, if you're doing gardening, you could put, still potentially be uh, a concern in terms of COVID, but they do more than gardening. CH Yes, they do much more than gardening. So what's the logic where people are going into providing care and support in somebody's home, an older person's home, what's the logic of not ensuring that they also have uh, access to the retention bonus? So, so the, the, the policy intent is those workers with a higher risk um, because they're doing um, in that residential and home care environment. So that... that direct care work rather than people who are less proximate and less, less at risk. Um, the, the, the policy was originally devised because there was a concern that workers would uh, be scared to come to work and the judgment was that the, those who would be scared to come at work were those who were most at risk of um, a close interaction with a, with a, um, with a CHSP recipient, or sorry, a, a home care or residential care recipient. So for those people that are waiting on the home care list to get access to a package and stay on CHSP, who do get a significant amount of care support, you're saying that they, it's not important that they're retained in, in the system, that they get the retention bonus? I, I didn't say that, Senator. I said that... Well, that, they're not getting it, and you're no, saying they're providing a lower level of care. I'm, I'm saying are that... Are they essential? I'm saying that the the... The concern and the intent of the policy was to make sure that those people who had a close direct care interaction, a frontline interaction with a with a recipient who were most at risk of contracting the virus and therefore most likely to be um, concerned about coming to work, the retention bonus was targeted at those those staff to get them to to come to work. Is it is it true that um, at, well, in fact, you've just articulated that some providers provide provide both home care and CHSP, um, and so some of those workers to those organisations and local go and local government provide Victoria a lot of this care. Um, some of them are, are getting the retention bonus if you are providing a home care package, if you're a worker providing a home care package but not if you're providing CHSP. That, that's right, that's, that's the distinction. So can you just take on, so I don't use up all my time, but it would be useful for people, for me to understand then what you see as the care that's provided from CHSP, because clearly I have a different understanding from some of the workers that I've been talking to about what they do and my understanding is a lot of them come in direct contact with a person, not just gardening, with an older person, 
and could also a provide uh, and and could also be uh, at risk during this COVID pandemic or provide a risk during this COVID pandemic. Yep, we can take that on that. Senator Seward, do you want to wrap up? Um, You'll get more goes. Don't worry. Okay, thank you. Um, I would just like. Can I ask one more question? Mm -hmm. Um, I'd like to go to uh, Ms Anderson. You talked about increased uh, regulatory approach that you're taking. Um, could you uh, outline that? And I'll obviously come back and ask more questions later. Certainly, Senator. Um, perhaps I can go to one particular initiative. We have commenced uh, an infection control monitoring program, uh, specifically in the uh, Victorian outbreak uh, restricted zone uh, and, in, and in parts of Sydney. Uh, we commenced it in early August, as of the 19th of August. We've undertaken uh, 74 spot checks uh, in Victoria and 41 spot checks in New South Wales. We will continue this program uh, for as long as necessary. Uh, we are sending in uh, two-person two teams, regulatory officials from the Commission, and the purpose of these visits is to uh, observe the use of personal protective equipment, to uh, interview staff, to uh, understand the way in which they practice hand hygiene, uh, physical distancing, um, use of sanitizer and so on. Uh, and uh, as a result of these visits, uh, we have identified some services who uh, will need some follow-up from us. So it is a, a regulatory uh, an opportunity for further for regulatory action to flow from the visit. Uh, more recently, we have also been having conversations uh, with health services, uh, and they are uh, they've in indicated an interest in what we're doing uh, and in working with us to amplify uh, that role. Okay. Thank you, Senator Seward. I'll go to Senator Patterson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll direct this question to the minister or officials, whoever feels they're best able to answer. Um, there have been some distressing reports in the media of hospitals being either reluctant or, in fact, outright refused. We just, we just lost your sound there for a second, Senator Patterson. Sorry, is yep. that, can you that, hear me now? Yeah. Um, Thank you. So I was just saying there's been some distressing media reports about hospitals either being reluctant or outright refusing to accept aged care residents being transferred into the hospital system. Uh, I'm interested to understand, um, has that been occurring? And if so, how widespread has that practice been? Um, Senator, well, I'll, I'll let the Minister go first. Uh, thanks, Senator Patterson. Look, there, there have been some issues in that circumstance. Uh, we've been working pretty closely with the Victorian governments and officials, particularly through the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre, to ensure, firstly, that there was capacity within the Victorian health system to accept um, aged care residents. Um, I think we might have discussed last time the importance of the agreement to see selective surgery to provide and free up capacity. Um, uh, but there have been some reports, uh, both from providers, about a reluctance to uh, accept um, residents. But uh, that, that's not only been addressed, it's being managed now through the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre. And there's in excess of 400 aged care residents now in hospital in Victoria, mostly in private hospitals. Uh, but uh, the work that we've done uh, importantly, in cooperation with the Victorian Government through DHHS, uh, has assisted us to manage that because there are times where uh, the availability of hospital beds, not just for clinical needs, uh, but also for ma uh, facility uh, management purposes, uh, has been absolutely necessary and has been a really important tool for us in assisting a facility with a significant outbreak to actually manage its capacity and the circumstances for the residents. Mr Lai, did you have anything to add to that? I mean, just I think the Minister talked about over 400. I think the, the latest number is 441. And um, of that group, I think around about 130 of those people are COVID negative. So the, the private hospitals agreement, which the government entered into with the states, I think on the 13th of March, 
specifically to set aside uh, capacity, provide this option, um, has been a really significant uh, tool in um, in Victoria to to help with outbreak sites. The um, so the the kind of uh, hierarchy of the way in which an outbreak is is um, addressed in terms of hospitalisation is that obviously predominantly public hospitals are used where someone has a clinical need for hospitalisation and that um, has by and large been operating uh, as it should, older Australians getting access to um, hospital based on their clinical need. Uh, and then um, early assessment made around the capacity of a aged care facility to, um, to care for residents safely Co cohorting and, and care for them safely on site, and in which case in-reach teams from hospitals are often involved in the provision of that care. Um, and then, um, but looking with a, an eye to the both the um, the physical layout of a site to say, well, if if people can't be safely cohorted, that private hospital provides a way in which that can be safely done, uh, or that if a, a, an organisation, a facility is under significant stress, that, um, that sometimes it is used as a, as a way to take pressure um, out, of, out of that facility. And that's a key learning from um, uh, the early outbreaks in Dorothy Henderson and um, Newmarch, where um, it, it is now kind of accepted that to try and achieve a safe level of care in a facility under stress, that, that that hospitalisation option is a is a really important one. So just just so my understanding is correct, to the extent that this was a problem, it's a historical problem, not a contemporary one. It's no longer occurring. Look, I, look, I think that the uh, every day we see uh, a system under stress. As the minister said earlier, there's a significant number of health workers. Um, in fact, I think a higher number than in the aged care system who are. Uh, isolated because they're COVID positive or a close yeah. contact, and so that that system is under significant stress, and um, and there are occasions where, um, you know, we, we've had some occasions where um, th that issue has to be uh, tackled. The 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 VARC, the the Victorian Operations Centre, which has DHHS staff, uh, so Victorian government staff as well as um, Commonwealth staff, ADF, and others. Um, has been a significant um, step forward in terms of being able to resolve those issues and to make good judgments with with all the parties in in the one one centre. So I think, you know, look, there are definitely isolated cases where we've had uh, difficulty, but I think that operation centre is really doing its job in terms of smoothing yeah. smoothing those occasions over. That's good because obviously there's um, there's two issues here. The one is aged care residents have the same right as any other Australian to access hospital care should they need it, um, uh, including if they're COVID positive in an aged care setting. But also th the other fellow residents in an aged care setting who are COVID negative have a right to remain so if possible and an early transfer into hospital of a COVID positive patient could help avoid that, couldn't it? Uh, that's right. And look, the, the, the judgment's got to be made case by case because um, sometimes the, the right way to achieve effective separation of positive and negative uh, residents is to, is to use hospitalisation of the negative uh, residents. Yeah. Um, on other occasions, it's, it's, um, you'll have residents with particular um, behaviours uh, who, uh, people with dementia who are likely to wander through a facility. And so it, we take that into account. And so it's, it's very much a case by case judgment about how to do that. And you've also got to respect, and this is an issue, I think, another learning from New South Wales, uh, from Dorothy Henderson and Newmarch, uh, really being making sure that providers have their end of life plans or advanced care directives for their residents up to date so that their wishes can be respected. Because we have had instances where a resident, uh, COVID positive or negative, their wishes are to, to remain um, either to remain on site or, or to take another decision. So we have to respect that. Understood. And um, capacity in the hospital system really shouldn't be an issue given the cancellation of elective surgery and given the Commonwealth Agreement to effectively enlist the private hospital system and that kind of surge capacity, should it? I think the, the 
stepping down of um, non-emergency elective surgery in Victoria has, um, it, this is how the private hospitals agreement was conceived and it's working as it was designed, that, that as the uh, rate of community transmission increased in Victoria, that that uh, stepping down of that activity then um, freed up that private hospital capacity. Um, and we, with the Victorian government and through the, um, through the VARC, the operations centre, we have a line of sight to uh, capacity coming for going forward in um, in private hospitals. So we've got a bit of a advanced knowledge about how to place people um, should there be an outbreak. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, moving on to Professor Murphy. Uh, Professor Murphy, previously uh, in this committee, I've asked you about the extent to which the effective reintroduction of the virus in Victoria has contributed to this problem. I've, um, I've been advised that rather than describing that as community transmission, it's more technically correct to say clusters of transmission. So I'll, I'll try and do that. Um, but since I last asked you about that, more information has come to light through the hotel inquiry in Victoria about the role that hotel quarantine played in this re reintroduction. Could you take the committee through your understanding of that updated information? Thank you, Senator. So I think there are two issues. One was obviously the hotel quarantine breach and the genomic uh, information that's been released in the Victorian inquiry has indicated that uh, the vast majority, if not all, of the current cases do relate to that quarantine breach. But I think it's really quite important. 99%, I think. 99%, yeah. So I think it, it seems very likely that this current uh, community outbreak in Victoria is related to that. But there are two aspects to it. Um, New South Wales also had significant seeding uh, from Victoria uh, of a similar extent. And I think the, the most important lesson of all from the Victorian outbreak for every jurisdiction around Australia is to make sure that they go back and check their public health response. This virus is incredibly infectious and unfortunately the Victorian public health response was unable to control the outbreaks in the, in the way that New South Wales has done. New South Wales has effectively stamped out what was an outbreak of a similar size to that in Victoria. At the time in May when we collectively as a nation agreed to open up, uh, one of the conditions precedent that I and HPPC were very, very insistent on was that we felt that we, each state and territory had the capacity to detect and contain and stamp out outbreaks. We knew we would get more outbreaks. We have seen them in New South Wales. They have controlled them. And I think Victoria, did e they, they did everything they could, but this virus got the better of them. And uh, I think the challenge is that every state in the country needs to now look, because the one thing we can do to protect elderly Australians is to not have another outbreak of this size in Victoria. Ever since January, that's what's been driving me, the primary driver of our whole national response has been to stop widespread community transmission because everywhere in the world we know it's, it has disastrous consequences. So that, to me, is the lesson learnt. Uh, every, uh, and I, and I, I think every state and territory needs to go back and check to see that they've got all of those systems and processes and uh, to, to make sure that they can do that. And I, am, I do want to pay extraordinary credit to New South Wales, who've had a very, very significant outbreak in the last few weeks, and they have got on top of it. And that's the model thank for you. the rest of the country. Senator yeah, Patterson, and, and are you you're almost done? You've had 15 yes, I just want to ask a follow-up question just to explore that briefly, Chair. Thank you. Um, other than the hotel quarantine failure, one of the clear failures of the Victorian government's public health response has been contact tracing. There's been some incredibly alarming reports in the media in the last couple of days about this, including on 3AW yesterday, where a caller reported that his mother-in-law was diagnosed with COVID in early July. Uh, she died on the 31st of July, and the first sign of a tracing call was on the 7th of August, nearly a week after she died. What has been the differences between the Victorian contact tracing and the New South Wales contact tracing that has produced such radically different outcomes? Well, I think I think the ref a reflection on Victoria at the present is that they, for the last few weeks, they have been overwhelmed. Once you get a transmission where you've got 700 cases a day, no matter how 
well established on how, how big your staff are, it's very, very hard to manage that. The challenge was always to, to have the systems to stop it getting beyond those first 20 or 30 or 50. And I think they have acknowledged that they, that they had uh, system issues and, and that they, New South Wales has had a much longer and of history of devolved public health response across the system. And Victoria has acknowledged that they have had to do a lot of work in, they did a lot of work in February, March and April scaling up and they were pretty confident that they had done what was necessary but unfortunately this virus spread so quickly that they, well, they've obviously had to do lots more now to make sure that once they bring it under control and it's fantastic they are bringing it under control now, only 179, I think, cases today. It's finally coming down. Um, but they will be, I'd be very confident that Victoria has done huge things now to make sure that a further outbreak will not occur of this nature. It is such a cru crucial issue. Okay, just, just one final clarifying question on that, please, Chair. Um, what is it, though, that Victoria specifically lacked? Was it a lack of qualified contact traces? Was it insufficient resourcing for the team? Uh, was it bad systems in following up? What, what have they lacked that New South Wales has? You, you said something about the devolved structure. What's that? Well, I think New South Wales structure has had public health teams in every local health district with led by senior physicians, and they they can have a local response to that. They have had a public health training system. And New South, there are many states and territories like Victoria that don't have as well developed systems as New South Wales. New South Wales is the leader. And, uh, and I think uh, it is very, um, it's very educational for the whole nation to look at New South Wales and how they have responded, because I think every one of us needs to, to think that way. So that decentralisation, decentralised structure is key. De decentralisation, the number of public health physicians, the IT systems that support it, um, and that really strong clinical leadership from public health physicians are all important factors in the New South Wales success. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Murphy. Thank you, Senator Patterson. Um, Minister Colbeck, as aged care minister, you're not a member of the federal cabinet, are you? No, I'm not. Um, have you attended the Federal Cabinet to brief your colleagues on aged care since your appointment? Uh, I've attended a number of Cabinet meetings in relation to age, aged care and ERC meetings. Okay, so you, you uh, was when, when did you first brief the Cabinet on aged care? Uh, I'd have to take that on notice, Chair, and get the dates of those particular meetings. Was it after the Royal Commission's um, report in, in uh, interim report in October last year? I'd have to check the dates, Chair. Did you brief the Cabinet on the Royal Commission's interim report? Uh, look, I'd have to check the record on that, Chair. Um, really? Uh, I, I, you don't I have, recall I, whether you briefed your colleagues on the Royal Commission's interim report titled "Neglect." There were a number of there were a number of uh, briefings that I've given to cabinet, uh, and I'd, I'd have to check the record. How many times do you think, approximately, that you briefed cabinet on aged care matters? Again, I'll have to check the record, chair. I'm not going to speculate or guess a number, but I've addressed cabinet uh, and. Uh, on many occasions, uh, with respect to um, with respect to aged care, and particularly to the COVID nineteen pandemic. Okay. Well, when was uh, when was the last time that you briefed the cabinet? Uh, I was in ERC this week. I'm not talking about ERC. I'm talking about the cabinet. Uh, I was um, scheduled to uh, brief cabinet. Uh, I think about two weeks ago, but um, my IT system, my, my uh, IT systems were down, so that briefing didn't occur, and, and the briefing was conducted by uh, Minister Hunt. Have you briefed the cabinet on the Victorian outbreak? That was the purpose of that meeting. So Chair. that was two weeks ago. Uh, that's what the um, first week of August. The outbreak started in July. So you're telling me that you have not briefed the cabinet you, well, between you, you the are, outbreak and the you, first week of August? 
you asked me when the last one was, Chair, and that was the, and I'll get you the specific date, um, uh, and I'll get you all of the other yeah. dates. Of, well, then I uh, asked you have. I asked you after you said the technology fail of early August that had you briefed them on the Victorian outbreak? Uh, Chair, and I you said that was the purpose of the August uh, meeting. It, it was, Chair. It was to specifically talk to the Cabinet about what was happening in Victoria at, yeah. at, in time. But unfortunately, the Cisco system was down that day and so sure, on. Sure. We're all living with the Cisco system. But I, I then, when you said that was the purpose of it, I said, so that was in early August. Had you not briefed them on the Victorian outbreak in the month of July? Well, Chair, um, uh, the date was the 5th of August. So you uh, haven't? OK. I've, I've just, it's just been provided to me, Chair, so um, I'm trying to assist the committee. No, that's... Uh, and, uh, and, of course, um, uh, what, what cabinet discussions are obviously confidential, but there are regular communications with senior officials with respect to Victoria on a regular basis. So again, I'm just trying to understand that I acknowledge there was a meeting scheduled for the 5th of August that you weren't able to attend, so Minister Hunt did it. Um, can you let, inform the committee of whether you have briefed the cabinet between the 10th of um, July and the 5th of August? Uh, I'm not, I don't believe that I attended a cabinet meeting in that period. I'll check the record for you. So the answer to that is no. So ha the cabinet's making decisions about aged care without the input of the aged care minister. Is that right? No, that's not what I said. I'm trying to understand so, again the, so, the state of knowledge so I, in, ju I'm, in I'm, July. I'm, under any circumstance where there's been a decision that's been required with respect to the COVID outbreak, uh, I have been present. Right. But there was none of those between July and the 10th and August the 5th, which is when the, the peak of the outbreak in aged care homes was happening. Uh, well, Chair, there's been other forums that I've been able to provide advice. I'm not asking to... about other forums. I'm asking about the Cabinet the leaders, the decision makers, the government in charge of this system. Well, and you well, did Chair, not brief them during that time. I, Chair, I have been in daily contact with the Prime Minister, the Minister for Health and other senior cabinet ministers with respect to this with respect to the outbreak. So you have one daily. off one off chats with them, but no official no. briefing of the cabinet. We, we have we have daily briefings with respect to this virus and the outbreak in Victoria. Minister, how many national cabinet meetings have you attended? Uh, I'll have to I'll have to take that on notice and give oh, you. Oh come on! Surely, is it that many? Well, it, it, well, there's, it's quite a few, and there is there are committees of cabinet that would be included in that, and so I'll have to give you take that on notice and give you advice. Uh, but as I said, there is a daily briefing among senior cabinet officials and the prime minister with respect to the COVID nineteen outbreak. It's, it's can I go now, can I go to your um, to some of the information that has come out in relation to um, advice from the government and there's been I think both you and the Prime Minister have said um, that what happened particularly in St Basil's um, couldn't have could was unforeseeable couldn't have couldn't have been avoided um, Minister. On the 12th of March, a fact sheet went out around aged care preparedness, and that fact sheet says talks about the need for temporary workforce um, in case of staff shortages in a facility due to the impacts of the virus. It also points out that older Australians are at increased risk of developing disease if they contract um, COVID-19, and in particular, if not carefully managed, infection can spread through aged care facilities. So that's the 12th of March. So clearly the government was aware of risks uh, at that point in time. We've also got Dorothy Henderson Lodge um, report, which also draws attention to the major challenges being maintaining staff numbers and compliance with infection protection and control procedures. When did you re ha get, have access to the Dorothy Henderson Lodge re review? Uh, I received that, I 
think in early April. So in early April. So we've got your advice going out you've, in March. You've got that in early April. Um, we've got new March House report. When's that going to be um, released to the public? Uh, that will go to National Cabinet today. In fact, it is being discussed at National Cabinet today prior to its release. Is it going to be publicly released? Yes. Okay. Um, so you certainly knew the issues around staff impacts on staff shortages, the risks associated with that in April. Is that correct? Well, March, Chair, April. Chair, Chair, we learned some of the issues with respect to uh, staff during the Dorothy Henderson Lodge outbreak in March. Yes. Yep. But your fact sheet of April already highlighted it as a potential risk. On the 12th of April, you announced a strategy specifically looking at managing workforce, where you told Australians via media release um, that you had, and I quote, we have plans in place for worst case scenarios when an outbreak in aged care facilities means local staff are unable to continue to provide care. That's correct. You stand by that? Yes, I do. Well, if you, if you had plans in place for the worst case scenarios, how has what occurred at St Basil taken you by surprise? Well, St Basil's was a situation not just of care staff, which is what we were anticipating as a part of our planning, but it, it took out the entire... Matter. It doesn't say that in any of the documents, just care staff. It doesn't call them... It doesn't say that. All of the documents just talk about workforce. Uh, that's, that's correct, Chair, but uh, our, our anticipation of work was care workforce. That's what we were looking at. Uh, and that was the clear inference from my point of view in respect of the documentation that we put out. We did not anticipate that the entire management structure, the office structure, uh, cleaning, um, catering staff would all be regarded as close contact as a part of uh, an outbreak. Uh, that uh, unfortunately did occur uh, and was declared by DHHS at, uh, at St Basil's. Uh, and of course, uh, off the back of that, uh, we've we've uh, made moves to ensure that we have those capacities available to facilities as well, um, in, in the circumstance where that where that might occur again. Well, Minister, I, I've heard I've heard you say that a few times now. And it's a convenient interpretation of these documents, to say the least. The the information that I've seen from the Commonwealth says, keep in mind, 80 to 100 per cent of the workforce may need to isolate in a major outbreak. It doesn't have an asterisk that says just care workforce. Um, you know, so either, well, Chair, either it's you... a reinterpretation of what you actually knew or your planning was inadequate because you Chair. told people on the 12th of April that you have plans in place for the worst case scenario when an outbreak in an aged care facility happens. And people look at that and they trust you. And Chair, based on our planning, that's what we sincerely believed at the time. Uh, and it was, as I've said, and I will continue to state, based on the care workforce, and, and we did not anticipate that the entire workforce, the entire, uh, including management, back office, cleaning and catering staff would all be declared close contacts. We did not anticipate that. So your worst case scenario planning was, well, how would you describe that now? Would it be almost worst case scenario planning? Well, or I don't... just case scenario planning? Because it clearly wasn't speak... worst case scenario planning, as you told us in a media release. I don't seek to go back and try and reinterpret it, Chair. We made an, we made an assessment of what we thought the circumstances would, would be. Uh, we put in place planning for that. Uh, and, uh, and in the case of St, St Basil, we encountered a circumstance that we didn't anticipate. Uh, and of course, we have learned from that experience uh, and we've put measures in place to ensure that those resources are now available. In terms of your workforce strategy, your surge strategy, um, I think that was what you were announcing on the 12th of April. Is that document available to the committee? I presume there is a document around surge workforce planning. If you had been uh, planning all the worst various scenarios, including the worst case scenario. 
Chair, those, that, that information is reflected in the advice that's been forwarded to the sector. What does that mean? There isn't a strategy or the strategy is the letters that have gone to the sector? Well, and also the contracts that we've put into place to uh, source workforce. Uh, and of course, we've continued to expand that capacity as the uh, scale of the pandemic landed it. But is there a workforce surge strategy, a workforce surge strategy for aged care? There's not a document. There's not a document things. when it's... <laughs> Minister. Incredible. This is one of the most significant challenges and you've, you've been talk, you know, all of you have been out saying we couldn't have foreseen what happened with staff, you, yet you told us on the 12th of April you'd done your worst case scenario planning and you had everything in, in order and then the worst happens and you're telling me there isn't a workforce surge strategy for the pandemic in aged care? Senator, there are a series of contracts that we've put in place and continue to build on as the demand for workforce has continued to grow within Victoria. But it's just uh, reactionary. It's just you're reacting, you know, and you'll put a Band-Aid there and a Band-Aid there. I'm after the plan. What was your workforce strategy plan knowing back in March that workforce shortage was going to be a major challenge in aged care? Because this fundamentally goes to the neglect of the of the older Victoria Australians in these homes where there have been significant outbreaks. It's been the, workforce has gone and their care has been compromised, seriously compromised. Senator, Victoria, can, can I introduce interject for a second? Uh, just as you I can said, try last, and help out, Professor as I said Murphy, last week. I presume that's Chair, can I can I say the core elements of all of these things uh, are in our COVID nineteen national strategy and it includes things like the hosp private hospital agreement which provides for capacity. So it's this is not just about aged care, it's about a public health response which incorporates uh, But the it is about aged care. You're the aged care minister. It there, is about aged care. That's the, where the, the vulnerability's been shown. This this is, this is also about a public health response and the bringing together of all of the resources that are required. And in, in our national COVID-19 uh, plan that was released, uh, which was the first document that was built by HPPC and released, issues such as workforce are a key consideration and that's why things like the hospital agreement uh, are so important because all of those things contribute to the capacity of uh, our capacity to respond to the workforce needs of the, of the, of the pandemic. But you're and the so, aged care minister. You're in charge of aged care. And of course, my, we want to and keep and people I, in their homes. So surely and, you and, have a workforce and, strategy about supporting people to live in their homes. And aged care forms part of the overall public health response, chair. Uh, and so uh, all of those things are brought together to uh, to develop. The, the, the overall national strategy and plan for the response to the pandemic. It is a public health response. So there is no specific workforce surge strategy for aged care that you can point me to? It's part of the overall public health response, as I've just said to you. Minister, um, in terms of St Basil's, last time we spoke, uh, you said that you had um, you know, there was five critical days where the Commonwealth didn't know and you weren't able to prepare your response into that facility. When did you become aware that that information was incorrect? Uh, if you're talking about the information that uh, we provided to the Senate, in, uh, Senate uh, a week yep. or so ago, uh, I found out that day. So you found out on the day of the hearing no, no, the day that I advised the committee. Oh, on the 7th, the Friday. So you appeared on the 4th. And how did you become aware of that? Uh, I received um, uh, a memo uh, or a call that morning. Uh, I arranged to have uh, a meeting between the Commissioner, Mr Lai and myself uh, to discuss the issue uh, and um, we, we worked through what a corrective action would be 
and also requested that the Commissioner advise the committee that day to, to ensure that you were informed of the circumstances of um, that new information. Okay. And um, you, you haven't corrected the record in terms of your own evidence, Minister. Do you think that um, that's something that you will do? Well, I, the, the evidence that I gave you was correct, and I also wrote to the committee myself that day, providing a copy of the advice from... Yes, uh, but Ms. no Ant correction of your evidence. I think your evidence was that the Commonwealth didn't know. I put it to you that the Commonwealth didn't know, and you said that's correct. That is clearly not correct well, now. Well, I wrote to you, providing you with advice of um, Ms Anderson's correction, so that you had received both that information from me and from the the uh, Commissioner. Um, we might come back to this. I certainly have some questions for you, Ms Anderson, but I'll go to Senator Seawitt first. Thank you. Can I go then just to the, very quickly to the issues about workforce and ask, it's not a surprise, it should not be a surprise to the Commonwealth in terms of the issues relating to workforce, given that A, there was a set of inquiry but also there was a task force set up to develop a workforce strategy, which indicated, uh, I think, to, to uh, 14, I think it was, recommendations or uh, focuses of action. There's been study after study about the need to increase care, and yet we're still unprepared to deal with this sort of emergency. So uh, why... Uh, the emphasis put on upscaling the workforce when we know very well that we have been short-staffed in aged care for a long time. And we also know the training has not been satisfactory. The Senate committee received overwhelming evidence of the failures and the inadequacy of training of care uh, workers. There's been call after call to increase nurses into aged care. So it, it cannot be a surprise to the Commonwealth that there is an issue around the level of care in, in residential services and facilities. Senator Seward, the issue of workforce in Victoria is, a, is an issue of depletion of the workforce in Victoria. Uh, I, I acknowledge the, uh, the work of um, the Workforce Industry Council, Council that was set up off the back of the Pelaeus report. Um, and the important work that that will continue to do with respect to development of the workforce. But the situation that we're facing in Victoria right now is one of uh, significant workforce depletion. So, as of... But, but, but Minister, if you had more staff in the first place, I'd, I'd put to you two things. If you had more staff in the workplace, you perhaps wouldn't get such a depletion, but I'd also put it to you that we wouldn't be facing the problem that we are now in terms of the reports that in some instances facilities had two workers or a lot of residents because of the depletion. So you Senator, can't just say it's because of the current crisis. I, Senator, I don't agree with the correlation that you're making. The situation at the moment is that we've got 1,426 as of yesterday staff who have contracted the virus. 1,426, as of yesterday, staff who have contracted the virus. There are many times more that number, possibly four or five times, that are isolating because they're close contacts. So that is taking something like five or 6,000 workers out of the aged care workforce in Victoria. That workforce is quite often supplemented from the Victorian health system. And as uh, departmental officials have said to you earlier in the hearing, there are almost as many healthcare workers who have contracted the virus and, and a number alongside them who are close contacts. You have a significant workforce depletion issue in Victoria. And that's why uh, the, importance of the, the importance of the decision to close uh, public uh, and private hospital uh, elective surgery so that that workforce could be freed up to assist with this Facility. That's why we're bringing in nurses and, and uh, aged care workers from other states to supplement the workforce. This is a this is a matter of a huge workforce depletion. Uh, and so, Minister, are you are you yes. arguing that if we'd had the workforce that has been identified for the hours of the care that's needed, the better uh, a higher level of clinical services and care providers available? 
that and and if we had had better training, that that would not have made a difference to this crisis. Uh, For example, if people had had proper and had and had uh, infectious disease control training, which we know was inadequate and not provide, and and lots of staff had not uh, received it. Well, uh, I I don't believe that. Uh, the staff had received no training in infection control. Whether it was, an ad it was adequate enough is a different question. But I don't believe that they'd received no start training. Well, we, knew, we know less than half had, had done the online training. Well, Senator, that was supplementary training. Uh, and, and providers are required to ensure that their staff have had training. So uh, that was supplementary training, not just not the training that they're required to have. And, uh, We've, we've taken additional efforts to ensure and check on that work and we know that the Quality and Safety Commissioner has done a number of pieces of work uh, specifically with respect to infection control. I mean, this, I, I think the point that you're making here is correct. This, with, within a facility, this is all about infection control. And so uh, facilities, I know, have been significantly alert to this. I was, uh, my office was talking to a provider only this week that's doing their own testing over and above the testing about, that's available through the Victorian Health System to try and protect his facility and their staff from COVID-19. So I don't accept the assertion that, that the sector or providers haven't been provided training or doing work to, uh, to protect their, um, their residents. I, don't, I just don't accept that because I know it's not the case. Well, we've already, the, just on the spot checks, we just heard the Commissioner, uh, Miss Anderson, say that they've identified failures or problems, I won't say, I, don't, I won't put words in her mouth, but, but ID problems in infectious disease control, and that's just in 74 spot checks. That, that's correct. In, and, in Victoria. And that's, and that's been the purpose of that process, so that the Commissioner could then go in and ensure that that work was being corrected. Commissioner, how many problems have you identified in those 70 in Victoria? I don't have a, a number that I can uh, offer you. Uh, in some instances, there have been uh, deficiencies in practice and we have circled back to each of those. We give on-the-spot feedback uh, because it is uh, essentially a continuous improvement initiative and then we uh, give them written uh, advice after we've done the visit uh, that they take on board and, and address. In some instances, there may be further action that we will take. This is, this is quite new, as you can imagine, uh, several weeks old, and it will continue to develop. So could you take on notice, please, in this, uh, I understood it was 74 in Victoria, 41 in New South Wales, is that correct? Could you take on notice how many problems in those 74 and 41 you found? Can I ask, are you intending to do this across Australia? My deep concern is the preparedness across Australia for uh, outbreaks in, in other areas. And given that we know the preparations that were done that Senator Gallagher was, has asked uh, a number of questions about were inadequate, um, where, are we, where are we at across Australia in terms of infectious disease control, spot checks, and also the, uh, you said that you're changing the process last time I asked around self-assessment. Where are we at there for national preparedness? Uh, the, in relation to spot checks, let me, let me zero in on that. Uh, absolutely fair question and clearly in the small amount of time we've been doing it, uh, it has illustrated for us its value. Uh, and we are looking for ways of amplifying uh, our workforce. I don't have enough staff in the Commission to do this across all of Australia, across 2,700 residential services and in, into the home care sector. However. However, Senator, I can see you're about to ask a question. Uh, however, yes. um, the, uh, each state health system, each chief health officer whom, uh, with whom I met uh, in an AHPPC meeting uh, earlier this week is very, very interested in what they themselves can do alongside me. And that's the conversation we now need to have. OK, so um, it's probably for the minister and yourself. What commitments has, have Australians got that this will be done as a matter of urgency in terms of the states not just being interested in it, but actually doing it, but also ensuring that the Commission has enough staff to do what is, it plainly needs to be doing. Uh, 
I, I can't speak for other jurisdictions, Senator, and certainly you wouldn't be expecting me to. Uh, no, and, but I'm, I'm, I do expect the minister to be talking to them. Yeah, no, fair enough. Um, I am aware through my engagement with HPPC that they're all leaning in. They are all very, very exercised by this very matter. As the minister has said, as Professor Murphy has said, it is fundamentally a public health response and they understand that. They understand that aged care is part of social care, is part of local communities. They have responsibilities. They're standing up for those and they are looking to work with the Commission because we have the tools, uh, we have the regulatory authority. We can work with them and we will work with them to ensure that this is rolled out nationally. Senator, Chair, a commitment was made uh, um, two weeks ago. Sorry, sorry, I can't. Sorry. I can't. Yep. Se Senator Seward, if I could just jump in there. Senator I'm Colbeck, did you want the call? Your, your colleague, Mr Lai, was also uh, attempting to answer there. That was the issue. Oh, okay, sorry. I was just going to say that the issue of um, uh, that Ms that, um, Anderson was just talking about was a, was a discussion at National Cabinet, an agreement at National Cabinet two weeks ago that uh, there would be a state-by-state -state, uh, approach to this in conjunction with the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. And I might just say also, Chair, that uh, the Commission's um, oversight activities have act in fact been national um, on, on a number of occasions to uh, get a sense of where the, the entire sector uh, sat. That work started uh, I think in March, Ms Anderson will correct me, when, uh, about when she started or the Commission started the process of um, doing uh, checks on residential aged care providers, the supplementary work that's been done on that. Uh, and, and it's not just um, a, a one-touch exercise. There are a number of tools that the Commission, as I understand it, uses. Uh, but in the context of the uh, the spot check process that uh, you've just been talking to the Commission about, that was a decision that came out of National Cabinet two weeks ago, and I suspect um, uh, will be supplemented by further decisions that come out of National Cabinet today. Sorry, Minister, I missed... Because the, I don't know whether it's the feed there or my feed here, but I missed when you very first started. Did you make a comment on uh, the additional workforce because I asked specifically about will extra workforce be provided to the Commission because the Commissioner had uh, said that you know there's a workforce issue for the Commission. Did you answer that particular point? Sorry I missed it because it was going fuzzy. I'm, I'm happy to um, send a see where if the Commission requires additional resources and capacity uh, we will provide it. Thank you. The spot checks that came out of uh, the uh, decision that was made out of National Cabinet, was that for across the country or just for Victoria and New South Wales? It, it, my understanding of that decision and my conversation with my Tasmanian State Premier was that that was a decision that each state committed to do. And, and have each of the states started that work, Commissioner? You said that you'd been talking to the uh, chief, the CMOs, as I uh, recollect, in each of the states. Has that actual work commenced? Uh, it may have commenced, uh, Senator, uh, in the absence of a, a particular agreement that has been struck with the Commission, uh, but uh, discussions will get underway very shortly in jurisdictions other than New South Wales and uh, Victoria, where we are currently doing those spot checks. Uh, obviously, we're prioritising those two jurisdictions because they have uh, uh, evidence of... Um, what's the language we have to use? The um, cl tr cluster uh, transmission. Okay, thank you. Um, Minister, have you ever done any uh, work looking at what you would need to invest to ensure that all of the residential uh, facilities around the country were COVID ready? Have you ever done, done any work to look at what is the level of investment needed to do that? Senator, can I just interject? I don't think it's possible in any part of the world to make a facility protected from COVID, no matter how well staffed it is. Of course we recognise that there are issues with staffing in aged care and the sort of work the Royal Commission is doing. The Minister has been very focused on that. That's why the Minister convened a workforce forum in February and March to, to, to plan for the search workforce. But we have seen more, <laughs> out, as many outbreaks in hospitals 
in hospitals in Victoria uh, with staff. We've got more Mr. hospital Sanofi, staff on, on that furlough. That is not the question I asked. Yeah. I asked specifically, had any work been done to make sure that older Australians in residential care, how much it would, how much you would need to invest, given what we'd seen overseas, um, to in, to in, to protect, well, to better protect, should I say? Well, we yeah, have invested to better protect. We've be invested with infection control training. We've invested in first responders. We've invested in the aged care response. That is not set. my question. Sure. My question is: Have you done any work on to look specifically at how much it would cost and what you would need to do? Well, I, I, I'll ask the minister to comment, but I would take issue with it. The, I don't think it's possible to completely protect any part of the society. I, but... I heard and understand what you have said. Mm -hmm. My argument is we could have done more to, to limit to the best possible point the level of infection, uh, the level of uh, uh, the number of residential facilities that did end up with an, or that will end up with an outbreak. And, and I think we've been doing that my question from the, the beginning. Minister. OK, yeah. if we could let the minister yeah. reply there. Chair, I, I actually don't not think that I agree with the uh, proposition that Senator C was putting to me, or to the uh, uh, that you could have limited the number of facilities that have uh, contracted a, an infection. I, I really don't believe that uh, I can agree with that because it is a direct function, and the, and the data actually shows. If you look at the data, it, it directly aligns with the rate of community transmission. And if you want to call it something else, that's fine. But the data clearly demonstrates that uh, the, the alignment of, of the rate of infection within residential aged care facilities aligns very, very closely, in fact, almost completely overlays the, the data around the rate of community infection. And uh, as I've said, as the Prime Minister said, no country in the world has been able to stop the ingress of COVID-19 into residential aged care in a circumstance where we've got where they've got high levels of community transmission. It's not. You, it, but they needed not, your extra uh, this, protection, this not, and they didn't get it. A, That's the this point. Is not a, this yeah. is not a mission thing. This is this is a matter of staff coming to work in an asymp when they're asymptomatic, not knowing they have the virus, and and an infection being developed within the facility. So if you don't think, if you don't think it's possible to reduce it, why are you putting in all these measures? Not that I'm arguing you should be, but why put in place all these measures if you don't think it's possible? Well, of course we should have the retention basis uh, bonus. Of course we should have the issues around uh, pandemic leave and expand it, by the way. Um, so I, I don't see your argument holds. In well, terms of reduce, trying to reduce it as much as possible. Well, of course we try and reduce it as much as possible, and that's why the measures that we've put into place well, have been put hence, in place. Hence my question. So why no. have you done any work on how much it would cost to protect... Uh, I'll expand it, actually, for older Australians in residential care, but older Australians knowing that, we're, that they're particularly vulnerable. Have you done any costing on how much that would cost in, or how much you would need to invest to ensure that older Australians, particularly those in residential care, were protected. Senator. Um, so hang your, on, your Chair, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll give stop the call to. This. Okay, this is your final question, Senator Seawitt. Senator Colbeck. Well, I just asked it. But yep, I, didn't I know. Answer. I know. And I'm seeing if there's an answer from yeah, Senator I, Colbeck. I, I, I don't believe it is possible to completely protect. All residents okay, residents but residents have you done the work? I think that's a separate question. We we understand you don't believe you're able to uh, protect people in aged care when there's a level of community transmission. I don't think we agree with you, but we, that's the position you're putting today. Well, that's, have that's you done the work? I, that's what Senator Seawitt's question is. Have you done the work about what the cost would be? And I, re I reject the assertion that you're making. I said it's not possible to completely protect uh, residents in residential aged care, because while there's community transmission, there will continue to be the possibility of ingress into aged care facilities. Well, and the very live possibility. You, yeah. well, you seem okay. to be focused on the we protect. I said. All right, Senator Seward, I'm not sure you're going to get an and answer we, to that question. And, and, and we continue to apply the resources in advance of 
uh, the growth of the, um, the pandemic to ensure that we have the capacity available to, to do everything that we possibly need to do. And we've not placed any limits on any resources, on any facility where there's been a, uh, an outbreak uh, uh, over, the last, uh, over the term of the pandemic. There's been no limit on the resources that we have been prepared to make available. Well, then, to, what, uh, we if, if that was true, why have we seen what's unfolded in the last two months, Senator? I mean, that, why aren't we, it's just ridiculous. Why aren't we ensuring that. community home support program workers are getting the uh, retention bonus, for example? That's a limit. So, so what, I, I, I has, what I said was, so don't try and change what I'm saying. I said we have placed no limit on any facility, uh, on the resources for any facility that has had a uh, COVID-19 outbreak. We have thrown every available resource at each of those facilities uh, and we have not placed any limits on that. So there is no limit to the resources that we've placed for facilities that have a COVID-19 outbreak. Senator, and Senator Watt. The question was about protecting them. Thank you, Senator Seawitt. Senator Watt. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Minister, can I just begin? We've obviously asked some questions about the numbers of older Australians who've passed away in aged care facilities. Do you have any figures on the number of veterans who have passed away from COVID while in aged care facilities? Uh, no, I don't have that level of granularity, I'm sorry. Is that, is that something that the department has compiled and could be taken on notice? Uh, Senator, we'd be happy to take that on notice and see if we can find that. Thank you. So, Minister, I just want to return to this issue about what are clearly the totally foreseeable issues around workforce impacts once we had COVID outbreaks. And you'll remember that a couple of weeks ago, the Prime Minister gave a press conference where he said that we just couldn't have anticipated the loss of workforce that we saw at St Basil's. That's just simply not true, is it? No, well, I disagree with you and I've disagreed with, with the committee this morning because it was in a completely different context to anything that we had seen before. Uh, and I've said to you this morning in evidence that our contemplation was in respect of the care workforce. But what happened at St, ba at St. Basil's? was that every single person on the site, including administration and management and uh, back office and uh, catering and, and cleaning staff were all declared um, close contact. And that wasn't something that we contemplated before. So, so, so that's, if it wasn't, that's if, it, it, if, it could, if it couldn't have been, if it couldn't have been anticipated, then why was it that back in April, the report on what happened at the Dorothy Henderson Lodge clearly identified the loss of a workforce and an inability to find staff as a serious risk. Surely that means it's anticipated. Well, not to the extent that we saw it with St Basil's. And St oh, so what, you might lose all the workforce but not your total workforce? Well, the workforce that was lost at Dorothy Henderson Lodge was the care workforce. But. We now know, I know, I know you didn't want to release the report on Dorothy Henderson Lodge, but it's now gone to the Royal Commission. So we now know that that report said that aged care centres would struggle to find staff in a coronavirus outbreak. How much more foreseeable does it need to be when you've got a report to that effect? Well, and as I just said to you, it was care workforce that they struggled with. Um, and that was why... Well, isn't that, isn't that, that kind of the crux of the workforce in an aged care setting? Let me, let me finish. Let me finish. And that's why we put in place very quickly a range of measures to, su to supplement workforce. So at Dorothy Henderson Lodge, they brought in some, some additional workforce from some uh, agency providers and that was also supplemented by some workforce that New South Wales Health assisted with. It was clear at that point in time that there needed to be other measures to put in place to assist providers supplement the workforce, uh, and we very quickly acted and put those measures in place. So we had. So when we had can I, we had, Well, I'll come to those. I'll come to those measures. I'll come to those measures. Continued to develop and grow that capacity uh, uh, throughout the course of the pandemic. Okay, I'll come to those measures in a moment. So, the Dorothy Henderson Lodge report 
which identified um, that in the event of an outbreak, aged care facilities would have a struggle to retain their workforce. When were you first briefed on that report? Uh, well, as I said, I think earlier, I received the report in early April. But, in early April. But, 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 well, but we'd already put measures in place by then to facilitate the support of, of providers to engage additional work. Okay, so you, you so knew... We, we, saw, we saw that early in our conversations, both with DHL. It was part of a workforce briefing that we conducted with the entire sector, including the unions, and I'd have to, to, to check the dates in March, where we all talked about workforce issues. Uh, the CEO... Of the you've known since March that in an outbreak you could lose most of your staff at an aged care facility. Well, if you want to let me answer the question instead of interrupt with, 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 with assertions, I, I'm happy to answer I'm just, the question. I'm just putting back what you're saying to you to confirm that. Well, and, 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 and that's why we acted in March to put in, 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 the, in place the provisions that would support that. And we okay. so you, 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 together to talk to them about I'll come, I'll come to the measures. And, I'll, and I'll come to the measures. In Canberra to, to let them know uh, what the issues were. We talked about the fact that we would be drawing from one workforce pool uh, at that point in time, in, particularly in the context of nursing capacity. Uh, and so we acted very early in the, in the piece to put in place surge workforce provisions. Um, because we, we clearly knew that it was an issue. So it's not a matter of us waiting for the Dorothy Henderson Lodge report. We acted uh, very early in the piece. And of course, in our national COVID uh, plan, workforce was contemplated. So you've known, since, you've known since March, you say, that a COVID outbreak could lead to a serious workforce shortage. Um, when when did when was the prime minister first briefed about that risk? Oh look, I'd have to take on notice specific meetings, but but we announced on the eleventh of March, so only a week or so after the commencement of Dorothy Henderson Lodge as um, as an outbreak, our uh, one hundred and one million dollar surge workforce plan. So the so the work for that. Uh, had commenced clearly prior to, the, to, to that announcement uh, because the decision had to go through our, um, our approval process as government. So, 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 the Prime, so, the, so the Prime Minister has also known since March that in the event of an outbreak, there would be a serious workforce impact on aged care facilities such that they may lose almost their entire care workforce. Well. You can, you can try and um, uh, embellish what was occurring. Well, what did he know? What, what was he briefed? What was we, he briefed? We, we saw a circumstance where there was going to be a need to, for the government to assist aged care providers early in March to uh, supplement their workforce. We, we put measures in place early in March to do exactly that. Okay, so, so you and the Prime Minister the whole are both are both aware since March that in the event of an outbreak, we could see a serious workforce impact in aged care facilities that lead to the loss at least of the care workforce. You're reminded of it in April when you get the Dorothy Henderson Lodge report. How is it then that the Prime Minister can say in July that what happened at St Basil's is couldn't have been anticipated. You've known for four months that this could Senator, happen. Senator, I've already explained that to you, uh, that it was a different circumstance. The circumstance at Dorothy Henderson Lodge and at Newmarch were the loss of the care workforce. That's where we saw the workforce being depleted. So what, you, what are, you, are you trying to say? That, are you trying to say that in March, you and the Prime Minister, all you really knew about was that you might lose a few staff, it might be just sort of your ordinary garden variety impact on your workforce? Senator, I've, I've stated to you what we saw. Um, I don't try and make some sort of clever characterisation of it. I, to I have told you what we saw. 
I've, and we acted very quickly with respect to providing resources for any facility that had a COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, and, and, and as I've said to the committee a number of times today, we have continued to build on the capacity of the system to provide people into a severely depleted workforce sector in Victoria. But, no. but the circumstance, the circ and I'll say it again, the circumstance at St Basil's was very different to what we'd seen at any facility where the depletion of workforce was within the care workforce. The, if that's the, the case. The situation at St Basil's was, was that everybody, everybody who worked at that facility was declared a close contact and required to isolate. If that's the case, if, if what happened at St Basil's was so unforeseeable, unanticipated, then why is it that on the 29th of June, your own department issued a document to aged care facilities saying, quote, keep in mind up to 80 to 100% of the workforce may need to isolate in a major outbreak. There may be difficulty recruiting agency staff during an outbreak. Sounds to me like this was entirely foreseeable. Well, Senator, I've already canvassed that answer this morning. Uh, and uh, I've said to you and to the committee that this was, that, that the anticipation was in care workforce. That's what we'd seen at Dorothy Henderson Lodge. That's what we'd seen at Newmarch. Uh, and I've said to you, and I'll say it again, uh, and I'll say it as many times as I need to. The situation at St Basil's was the entire workforce, not just the care workforce, the entire workforce, everybody who worked in the facility. And that is not something that we'd seen previously. But you, the, do, the document from your department doesn't distinguish between a care workforce and the gardeners, the cooks, the chefs, the cleaners. It says, keep in, and it's issued on the 29th of June, weeks before what we saw at St Basil's, it says, keep in mind up to 80 to 100% of the workforce may need to isolate in a major outbreak. You knew. Senator, you knew. I have answered your question. Uh, and we, uh, as, and, I've, and I'll repeat it again if you like. The circumstances that we'd seen and the basis of that advice was the fact that the care workforce had been depleted at DHL, it had been depleted at Newmarch, but we had not seen, nor did we anticipate, that the entire workforce of the site, including management, including the office staff, including the uh, cooks, the cleaners and the ground staff, we did not anticipate that the entire workforce would be furloughed as close contacts. But, I mean, the, the advice from your department doesn't draw that distinction. It talks about the total workforce, 80 to 100 per cent of the workforce. This is, a, this is what you and your department knew was a quite possible consequence of an outbreak. And yet you just let things roll on. Senator, I've told you what uh, we, we uh, said. We've, I've told you uh, what our, our um, uh, what we believed. I've told you what we've seen, and and I'll repeat: we did not anticipate at any point in time that everybody who worked on the site of a facility uh, would be uh, declared close contacts and furloughed. Wouldn't that so, be your worst case scenario, though? That you said you'd done. You said in April you, you'd done your worst case scenario planning. Surely the worst case scenario is that you have no one in a facility to care for elderly residents. Senator, uh, our, all, all of our experience related to care workforce, uh, all of our experience came to, to, to care workforce uh, and uh, that was the, the work that we'd been focusing on. Clearly, uh, we've changed uh, our, our approach since because of the experience of St Basil's uh, and uh, management capacity and leadership is now one of the really important things that we focus on when, we, when we're working with facilities in respect of an outbreak and, and quite frankly that was one of the key learnings that came out of, out of Newmarch uh, and that's why the Commission has in issued April. I mm. think I, I think now something like 20 notices to agree because ensuring that you have strong leadership capacity within the facility is one of the really important measures of the success of managing the outbreak. Senator Watt, my apologies for interrupting. That, that is okay. So, so you and the Prime Minister know from March 
that an outbreak may cause a serious workforce impact. You get the Dorothy Henderson Lodge report in April telling you that it might wipe out the staff of an aged care facility if there's an outbreak. Well, that's not what the report says. Sir. Well, okay, I'm paraphrasing. Well, the, in the 29th of June, your own in the 29th of June, your own department says that facilities might lose 80 to 100 percent of their workforce. But we're we're really supposed to believe the prime minister when he gets up on the 29th of July and says, "Oh, none of us could have predicted this." There's three separate, at least three separate warnings that this could happen, and so, it happens again. Senator, I've answered your question. Do you believe the prime minister? Senator, I I, I do believe the prime minister, uh, and I've answered your question as to the circumstances that led to that view, uh, and and uh, and I've expressed the same view myself. Uh, the um, all the circumstances that we've seen with respect to loss of staff at Dorothy Henderson Lodge uh, and at Newmarch were that the uh, care workforce was the workforce that was regarded as close contacts uh, and were furloughed. Uh, in, in, and in no outbreak before St Basil's, in no outbreak, and there had been a few, uh, in no outbreak had the entire workforce, including the management and everybody else on the facility been uh, declared by the state health authorities as close contacts. They have not occurred one, in any circumstance. One of the measures you said that you took in response to what we saw happen at Dorothy Henderson Lodge and elsewhere was the $43 million allocated for the surge workforce. Why, why has less than half of that been spent? when we've got more than a thousand aged care workers now having tested positive? Well, it's been spent on demand, uh, Senator. It's not, it's not, it, as, it's, as it's needed, uh, as it's uh, claimed back by providers, uh, it's spent. It's not a matter of uh, throwing So you think we've got enough people? Senator. Well, Senator, I've, I've said to you, uh, we have not limited the resource that we will make available for providers who have an outbreak. Uh, and if we need to supplement that, uh, we will. We have not limited the resource to any provider who had a COVID-19 outbreak. We've put every resource that we've possibly had available to us to ensure that uh, they have the capacity to deal with the outbreak. It hasn't, it's not been a matter of limitation. Uh, it's, it's been a matter of uh, dispersing this money appropriately uh, as it's been required. Okay, the Senator, uh, Senator Watt, I'm just going to just, we are entering the last half an hour of this hearing. Um, now, I understand Senator Davey would like a, a short amount of time to ask a couple of questions. I'm presuming, Senator Seawitt, you have some more questions. Um, and so, Senator Watt, perhaps if you take the next five minutes and then I'm going to have to re um, take the call and share it around a bit. <laughs> Yeah, Senator, no we, we can help. Um, Sorry, um, just a minute, Senator. What um, Mr. Lai just wants to jump in, I think. Just in on the expenditure, Senator, that the um, the uh, services who have an outbreak are allowed to come and claim costs outlaid after the fact. And indeed, if you look at Dorothy Henderson Lodge, which uh, at the time um, where we, we talked with the management, they knew that we would. Um, cover costs in relation to workforce surge because the grant guidelines, I think, hadn't been established at that point. Um, and they have only recently put in their uh, claim to us for the costs. And so I think there is a, um, there is a lag in, in terms of that expenditure, which reflects services' ability to put that, the, essentially send us the bill after an outbreak has been resolved. And so I, do, I, don't, I think that that's, it is misleading that the, I think the expenditure more is be, will be committed than, um, and that'll be the timing will reflect people's coming through the outbreak. Um, Minister, one of the things we've discussed is the, the lack of a plan, a real plan from the government to manage this crisis. And in response to that, you've often pointed to the Communicable Diseases Network Australia guidelines that were first published on the 13th of March. You know the document that I'm talking about? I do. Is there any, any reason that that document, which had been described as guidelines, was rebranded 
as a national aged care plan last Thursday? Uh, well, it forms part of our plan, uh, Senator, it always has. Uh, the foundation document of which is the, the national COVID um, health uh, response plan uh, and the, uh, the advice from the CDNA, which is a subcommittee of the HPPC, has always formed part of that plan. But up until last Thursday, it was called the Communicable Diseases Network Australia Guidelines. And then suddenly, last Thursday, after the government's been taking heat about the lack of a plan, it mysteriously gets rebranded as a national aged care plan. Did you have any input into that decision? It's always been part of the plan, Chair. It's all been part of it, just, been part. it was a plan that wasn't called a plan. It was it was a plan that was actually called guidelines and then became a plan when you didn't have a plan. Well, I reject the assertion that we didn't have a plan. We've had a national COVID-19 emergency response plan uh, that was issued uh, very early in the piece, and a number of other documents that have supported that, and the work of the CDNA was one of those documents. Can I ask someone from the department, was it the department's recommendation that the guidelines be rebranded as a plan, or, that, or did that come from a minister's office? Uh, Senator, I'd, um, it, it has been referred to by many people as a plan, because it is a plan. It's still, it hasn't been rebranded. It's still listed on the website. As, as the guidelines for uh, managing outbreaks in residential aged care. But because it is a plan, it can be referred to by people as a plan. I don't think how it's referred to in public changes the nature of what it is. Pretty handy thing to do when, you don't, when you're accused of not having a plan though, isn't it? I mean, the Minister, for the, Minister Hunt first referred to these guidelines as a national aged care plan last Thursday. Which what it is, Senator. That's what it is. I mean, it, well, but it's tied he'd to, to it. He'd never called it that before, though, had he? I'd, I'm not, I'd have, you'd have to ask him, Senator. So it, 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 look, it is still it is still on our website, listed as the CDNA coronavirus outbreaks in residential aged care facilities, residential care facilities, which is rather a mouthful. But since it's a plan, it's perf it would seem perfectly reasonable to refer to it as a plan. Do you think that rebranding documents helps people in aged care facilities? I'm not sure that it has been rebranded. I think it may have been referred to uh, in, in media as a plan, but it's not, its title has not changed. It exists as it always has done on our website. What about you, Minister? Do you think marketing and branding and spin is what people in aged care facilities are looking for from the government right now? Well, I, I agree with what the Secretary has just said. Uh, the guidance from the AHPPC uh, and the CDNA has always been there. It's been progressively updated uh, as knowledge has increased with respect to the virus uh, and provided to the sector appropriately so that they can ensure that they've got the provisions in place that they need to. Uh, I think it's, 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 actual, it's action that is what uh, the community is looking for. Uh, and You're damn right. You're damn right. right. Exactly what we've been providing uh, continuously through this. We've continued to to uh, to develop uh, our um, response, and, and we will continue to do that. Okay, Senator Watt, I'm going to have to um, yep. leave it there. Um, Senator Davy, perhaps if you have um, take us up to a quarter past, and then Senator Seawitt, if you and I share the final 15, if that's okay. Thank you, Senator Davy. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, and thank you to all witnesses for attending. Um, I want to ask uh, Professor Murphy, um, I want to understand, obviously we had the um, initial outbreaks in aged care in New South Wales that have now um, been investigated. We've currently got um, what can only be described as a crisis in Victoria, but we have also seen um, cases in Queensland and I, I believe more recently in New South Wales where staff from aged care facilities have been tested COVID positive, but we're not seeing the same level of outbreaks within the aged care homes as, as we're seeing in Victoria. Can you uh, explain to me the difference between how Queensland is managing 
um, their aged care, the aged care facilities in Queensland compared to um, what we're seeing in Victoria and why the management has appeared more effective? Is it because they're learning from watching what's happened in other states? Thanks, Senator. Uh, I believe it's probably more just a scale of the outbreak. We have to remember that in Victoria, particularly early on, there were a, a very large number of single worker outbreaks, single resident outbreaks that were expertly and very well controlled. The challenge in Victoria, as we have been saying all the way through this, has been that once you have that widespread community transmission, you have multiple daily incursions into facilities. Some of those can be well controlled, but if your public health response is so stretched dealing with widespread community transmission. Victoria has contained extremely well a large number of outbreaks, but it, once you get to that big scale, it becomes really, really difficult. And their public health response, we've acknowledged, was delayed in some, some circumstances. It's, I think it's largely a reflection of the scale of community transmission and the fact that they were overwhelmed. That's why I've been so worried about other states making sure that their public health response is, is ready. Um, sorry, thank oh, you. I thought we um, lost you there, Senator Davey. <laughs> very nearly. I'm, I'm going to have to jump off soon, which is going to work well for your timing, uh, oh. Chair. But um, <laughs> is it, would that also uh, explain why in regional areas and regional parts of Victoria where there have been incursions in aged care homes, but they seem to have been able to have been contained. Is that also, would you say that's due to the scale? Yes, I think that's right. I think there have been some suggestions that uh, there's less, there's a, a higher risk in uh, non-government aged care facilities in Victoria. That's, there's no real evidence of that. 95% of the facilities in metropolitan Melbourne are non-government and they're the large facilities in the outbreak area. The government facilities are in the regional areas where there is not much community transmission. And so, like in the early phases in Melbourne, when there was low-level transmission, the outbreaks were controllable. I think that's why there have been not so many in the regional areas. So it's, it's a scale thing. Melbourne is really where the action is. And uh, last question from me. I as you said, um, there has been speculation about the difference in uh, non-government versus government. But um, as far as you're concerned, the management and the response to COVID incursions in aged care homes should be, and uh, the advice to those facilities is the same, regardless of ownership. And, and, that, that's, uh, that's correct. They're all regulated and funded by the Commonwealth. Uh, the state government puts extra money into the state facilities. But we have, and there are very good state-run facilities and very good non-government-run facilities. And the evidence we've seen is that the exposure or the, the outbreaks have occurred according to the exposure risk, really. There's no, there's no good evidence to suggest that there is a difference in their preparedness uh, that we have seen. Thank you. That's all from me, Chair. Thank you, Senator Davey. Uh, Senator Seward. Thank you. Um, Professor Murphy, could I just ask you to clarify that your last comment in terms of there's no difference in preparedness? We, 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 we have no evidence of that. I'm not saying that there is evidence to the contrary, Senator. What I'm saying is that the epidemiology uh, suggests that the reason that the vast majority of outbreaks are in non-government facilities is because 95% of them are in metropolitan Melbourne where all the action is and the government facilities are mainly in the regions. We haven't systematically looked at the difference between the two, so I can't say either way. The, um, okay. the, the, the evidence oh, oh, oh. in um, New South Wales, Senator, the, uh, the learnings out of Dorothy Henderson and um, what we've observed at New March are that one of the discriminators are the organisational leadership uh, where there is an outbreak. And, and, and I would distinguish that between the sort of single staff outbreaks that Professor Murphy's talked about and more where a, a service finds themselves in a situation where there is infection before um, action can be taken or is no, known to be able to take. And, 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 and so 
the the ability of the leadership in those circumstances is a discriminator. We we think there's there's a number okay. of things. Yeah. Okay. That's that's. Thank you, Mr. Lyde. That's where I was. I wanted to go very quickly. Obviously, but in terms of what I've seen through some of the providers' comments and where there've, there's been some outbreaks, I was listening to one of the providers in Queensland response when they had their first case and. Uh, and it seemed to me that what he was describing was a very well coordinated, very well thought plan that they'd started to put in place in terms of before they had an outbreak. And so that's why I'm asking, it seems to me uh, there, there is differences between how providers have handled and prepared for a COVID outbreak. Would that be a fair comment to make? So I might just, uh, I think there's preparedness is, is in two parts. It's the provider and the public health response. And I think yes. in Queensland, okay. both of those okay. have come together. And I think in many instances in Victoria, that came together very well. We've seen a number of outbreaks that have been controlled. But I think, I think the challenge has been, as I said, when you've got the scale where the public health response gets overwhelmed. Sorry, Mark. Thank you. Which takes me to the questions that um, I wanted to ask, and I think it's probably um, more for the youth and Nicole Beck, uh, the Minister. In terms of the lessons learned, uh, National Cabinet was talking about pulling that together. Have you, you know, a document, um, have you, are you, have you got a timeline? Has that been pulled together? Have you got a timeline for that document? Uh, well, that's uh, I should say. So, so, uh, Senator Seawood, there were a number of discussions at National Cabinet two weeks ago with respect to um, some of the learnings from Victoria specifically. Uh, they relate to things like the Aged Care Response Centre that's been established in Victoria, which has done a great job in coordinating the relationship between uh, Commonwealth uh, agencies, state agencies uh, and uh, coordinating some of the specific needs of facilities with respect to an outbreak, with whether it's um, workforce resources, removal of waste, things like that that have developed uh, as issues. So that, that was contemplated and discussed at National Cabinet last week. Uh, there's been a lot of work that's been done since then. There's a, my understanding is that there's a further conversation with respect to that at National Cabinet today. Uh, and of course, we all await the results of that discussion, but there is has been a lot of discussion between the Commonwealth and the states, including at AHPPC, um, with respect to how we draw some of the things together and how we might duplicate the resources that we've had in place in Victoria to manage the outbreak if it's required in other jurisdictions. Thank you. So does that... Thank you for that, but it didn't sort of quite answer my question in terms of is a lessons learned document that is prepared or is that not what uh, National Cabinet's decided to do? Well, um, I can't tell you what National Cabinet might decide to do, I suspect, but that will be announced. That's what they had, sorry. But, well, they, they had a conversation last two weeks ago. They set themselves a direction at that conversation. Uh, that uh, There will be further discussions at National Cabinet today decisions and announcements um, I'm expecting will come off the back of the further discussions today. Okay, so, does, so do I take it that the, in that case the work hasn't even started on the lessons learned in I terms of think, I, don't, it? No. I, I don't think you can take it from that, Senator, but, I, but I'm not in a position to be able to preempt what National Cabinet might decide. I know that there's work that's been done, but I don't know what National Cabinet will decide. So, I mean, the fact I, that the fact that they discussed at the last National Cabinet meeting the possibility of setting up a response centre in each state, which they did, and that was one of the discussion points that came out of National Cabinet two weeks ago, indicates, demonstrates that they are looking at what's happening in Victoria, they are looking to learn from uh, those circumstances and they are looking to how they might apply those in, those other, in their respective jurisdictions. They will be the ones that make those decisions so clearly the work on learning what's happened out of Victoria and applying it has commenced. Okay, so did, did last time National Cabinet met, did they not urgently, did they not agree that they were urgently going to pull together a lessons learned document? 
I'm not sure that they called it that, Senator, but um, what they're looking to do is to um, learn from what's happened in Victoria and put in place the measures that uh, derive from those learnings. And that's the work that's been underway. Uh, it's being discussed today at National Cabinet. Um, once National Cabinet's concluded, you'll see the results of that. So how, how would it, if they're setting up, instead of having a national um, task force or body, whatever, the coordinating body, instead of having a national one and going with the state bodies, how would then those lessons be shared in, in an urgent way if there's an outbreak in another, in another state? Wouldn't it be better to have a national coordinating body? Well, uh, Senator, the National Cabinet is effectively the national coordinating body for the COVID-19 response. That's the peak element of the response. It always has been. That's why it was established. It's doing a range of things. Um, it, it, will make, it will make decisions today as to where that goes. Um, I'm not in a position to preempt. I, I understand what you're asking me, Senator, but I'm not in a position to preempt what the National Cabinet will decide today. Okay. I'm just, I, I just understood that there was a, a lessons learned docu document going to be agreed to last time, and it sounds like there's been no work done on that to pull that together, because my next question was going to be timeline. I haven't said that, Senator, um, and uh, I don't agree with the assertion in the question. There clearly, but there clearly have been lessons learned out of Victoria. That's why that's, that, that, that's demonstrated from the discussion at the last National Cabinet meeting. What I'm saying to you is I can't preempt what the decisions might be out of National Cabinet today. Yeah. And I'm, I'm asking, I'm not saying that they're obviously you're, you're making decisions based on things that are happening in Victoria, but in terms of a document to share across Australia or a process to ensure that we have more formal processes in place, the commencement of developing that sounds like it hasn't started. Well, I, I don't agree with the assertion, Senator, but I can't preempt what um, National Cabinet will do, say, or release. Senator Seawitt, um, you've got one minute. Uh, I, but I don't, I don't agree with the, the assertion of the question. Uh, there has been considerable work done with relation to the learnings out of Victoria. Um, considerable work done, I know that. Uh, but, but, I, but I cannot preempt what the National Cabinet will decide. Okay. okay. Can I, thank you, can I uh, very quickly go to um, Professor Murphy? You've got one question, seriously, Senator Yeah, Sarah. I know, on chemical restraints. I asked about chemical restraints last, uh, last week and I'm wondering, have you got an update? Has there been any other further uh, examples or evidence of chemical restraints being used uh, specifically related to uh, circumstances of COVID? Not, not that I'm aware of, Senator. I don't know whether the Commission has had any complaints about it, but I'm not aware of any. Um, Senator, uh, <clears throat> I, I understand that you were talking with uh, Professor Mercy last week about uh, an incident which had been reported. Uh, I yep. think that had to do with Glen Nim. Uh, was that the, the relevant service? Um, we, we have actually issued a notice to agree, which is a regulatory instrument, uh, uh, in relation to that provider. We have asked them directly uh, about uh, those reports, those allegations. The provider did uh, indicate that uh, the, the report was wrong, but uh, we nonetheless were sufficiently concerned about that and some other aspects of their performance to issue this regulatory instrument, which allowed us to put an independent advisor in there and to ensure that they, the, uh, the provider uh, and the staff on site were taking very clear direction from both the independent advisor and the health service. Um, we have uh, come upon a, a number of instances where there does appear to be uh, a level of restraint being used in specific circumstances. I won't take too long. Um, very briefly, uh, where a service is experiencing a lockdown, um, then an individual who has a tendency to wander, uh, if they're COVID positive, presents a risk to others, or if they're COVID negative, experiences a risk in their own right uh, through that wandering behaviour. Uh, Restraint continues to be a last resort. That is the law. Those are the quality of care principles and they must be abided by. In that context, we expect every single provider to explore every reasonable option other than restraint before it is considered. 
and if it must be considered because there is no other option available in order to protect one or a number of individuals in that service, in that particular setting and context, then the restraint in whatever form it takes must be used for the minimal amount of time, it must be clinically overseen, it must be reviewed regularly, uh, and of course, if it is chemical restraint, there must be a consent process before the drug is administered. Okay, Senator C, we'll have to continue this discussion at another um, hearing or estimates. Um, Ms Anderson, just I'm sorry we are running really out of time. Um, part of the reason we've had the additional hearing is to just inquire into what happened uh, around um, the breakdown in your organisation in terms of notifications, acknowledging uh, with the caveats around that you cover up in your letter. But on the 4th, uh, so you appeared here on the 4th of April, of August, sorry, and um, at that point uh, you'd said you weren't aware of the, the A um, Quality and Safety Commission wasn't aware of St Basil's until I think the 14th of um, July. Now you've corrected the record. How did how is this brought to your attention and when? Uh, just just a, a, a matter of detail, Senator. My answer was uh, that's correct, and the question was, Ms. Anderson, you weren't aware of the situation. I actually was accurate in my answer. I was not aware. However, the commission was aware. Um, the the matter was brought to my attention that afternoon. Uh, so and on the fourth. Big pardon? On the 4th? Uh, yes, on the, on the afternoon of the, the hearing, yes. Okay. Uh, and then I immediately asked for uh, urgent briefing uh, and all the details around that. I secured that over the next uh, day. Uh, and then, as the Minister outlined, I informed him on the Friday morning. I provided a, a brief to him and I indicated that I would be providing a letter to the Senate Committee that same day. So it took you three days to brief the Minister about this? I had to understand exactly what had happened. We had to go back, look, look at the original record, uh, understand what, uh, what circumstances applied to the, uh, um, the way in which that information had been delivered to us. I wanted to double check that we had recorded it uh, and then I needed to uh, be very clear about the, the way in which that information had been uh, recorded within the Commission and whether there had been any subsequent conversation with anyone in relation to that, that, uh, that piece of information. And that took three days. Did you speak to anyone else during that time? Did you seek advice? Like, did you speak to Professor Murphy? Did you engage with? No, with I don't. I don't recall having done so. It was. It was a matter for the commission to determine uh, what used to be made with that information. Because it's a pretty. It was a pretty um, critical breakdown in your processes, um, which I think we've we've gone through at previous hearings. The fact that the Commonwealth didn't. Well, it was alleged the Commonwealth didn't know um, until the 14th of July, four days, I think, four or five days after the first um, intervention and notification of a COVID-19 outbreak. We trusted I think the, the we minister trusted the had been on the record saying he wasn't aware of it. He'd done media interviews saying he wasn't aware of it. Like, don't you think it warranted a more urgent response to say that to inform the minister of this error? I had already erred in giving the Senate committee wrong advice. I didn't want to make the same mistake twice, Senator. I wanted to be very clear of my facts before I corrected the record. Okay. Um, and what you found is that it went to a, uh, it, was, it was information that was provided to um, one of your officers that's correct, yes. A, a regular self, official. A kind of a self-identified person at St Basil's, self-identified that there'd been a, a COVID positive case that went to one of your officials. That official then took it to the COVID-19 response team. Which is within the commission. Okay. And that response team noted it down in what's called a COVID-19 confirmed case tracker, and that's where it ended. That's correct. Okay. Um, and so what, what have you changed? Is the response team now geared to respond? 
The response team, Senator, is exceptionally busy responding I'm, all I'm the no time. I have no doubt about that. Uh, what we've now done is ensure that when we come, come, become aware of uh, information in relation to an outbreak, we double check uh, our records and we also check with the, at least with the Department of uh, Health, in um, the Commonwealth Department of Health, and given that it's Victoria, with the Department of Health and Human Services. So we won't see this occur again? No, Senator. We uh, took the word of the provider that they had in fact uh, advised the PHU. We will now be far more assiduous uh, and double down to ensure that all of the necessary notifications but your, are... your own documents say you have to notify the Commonwealth? To us, Senator. Yeah, no, I understand that. The provider, um, the provider is required yeah. to notify, uh, yes, the, so the PHU and the Commonwealth. What I'm saying is, so your, your officer um, did establish it to be noted to notified to the Victorian government, but didn't notif didn't establish whether it had been notified to the Commonwealth, as is required by your documents. The record is unclear in that regard. We don't have a record that uh, there was. But a... it didn't happen because we know that these guys didn't know, so we can presume it didn't happen. Okay. Um, thank you, Ms. Anderson, Minister. My final question to you. I think after this hearing. Um, uh, I'm in no doubt now that there was a massive failure of the aged care system in Victoria. It's cost hundreds of lives, um, thousands of families impacted, elderly Australians left without food, hydration, or they're having their personal care needs met. Um, the Defence Force has been called in. I mean, that's the situation we found ourselves in in Victoria. This is the system that you fund and regulate. You're the minister for it. Was this situation acceptable on any level? Well, clearly, Chair, and uh, I've acknowledged it before, the Prime Minister acknowledged that we didn't get everything right. We continue to work uh, with the Victorian Government every day on what is a combined uh, federal government, state government responsibility for public health. Uh, and uh, as I've said to you a number of times, we apply all resources to assist facilities to manage the outbreaks that they have uh, without limit. So we continue to build the response uh, as the demand is required. Uh, and, uh, and we have, uh, have acknowledged that uh, in some circumstances, we haven't got it all right. I think we'll leave it there uh, today, Minister. Uh, we do thank you for your time. This concludes today's proceedings of the committee's inquiry into the Australian government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. I thank the minister for making himself available and officers again for appearing before the committee. I remind you that answers to questions taken on notice are due within 10 working days and the committee stands adjourned.